Good morning, everybody. It's an early one and a late one and one that starts at all different hours across the world because obviously that's me on the chat right there um, talking to you guys. And yes, there is a difference between an alpaca and a llama other than the spelling. I don't really know the difference, but apparently one spits, the other one doesn't. I'm not going to repeat what the other one does do, so that's probably for another conversation. But more importantly, I actually have Michael Barber here just below me. Um, for those of you who don't know who Michael Barber is, he's going to explain who he is in just a moment, but I'm actually quite excited to see this uh, presentation because it's about a new camera and some of the things that it can do, and it's already got my brain buzzing on things that I can start using it for, and for those of you who follow my Instagram, you'll probably know that I'm not known for my deep sky photography per se. I do a lot of solar stuff, but recently I started doing uh, ISS imaging. So this camera looks like it's a really good contender to do this. But more importantly, the guy who knows all about it is going to talk. Mike, tell me about yourself. Ah. Good morning, Simon. Thanks for having me, by the way. This is my no, first thank you. experience and uh, I appreciate your inviting me. Um, I, you know, I, I don't, I, I've never liked talking about myself much, but uh, just to let people know kind of, you know, who I am, I, I've been around the CCD imaging world and amateur amateur uh, astronomy for over uh, 30 years now. I helped start, uh, I was one of the founders of another company some time ago and spent most of my time with them um, until it got sold off. And now I'm, uh, now I'm with QHY CCD. Uh, and I really like these guys. I like Dr. Q a lot, and uh, I like the fellows that work there. They're all amateur astronomers at heart. That's where they started in their backyard, just like we did a long time ago. And uh, now they're uh, now they're really uh, nice going concerned with uh, some high-end scientific cameras. So this camera this morning, um, my when I started preparing this, I thought I was going to be talking about more than just this camera, like like new products at QHY. So I did add some other things. I'll spend most of my time talking about the, the 462, which is the one that, that you are most interested in and most people will be interested in because it's brand new. Um, it uses the latest uh, sensor from Sony and uh, it's just real exciting. I'll, I'll get started if you're all, all set. So uh, just for you guys who are watching back at home, um, if you have questions, uh, feel free to post them now. We will do the Q&A at the end uh, don't be afraid to post your messages now or your uh, questions now uh, so we can collate them all together. So this way we don't ask the same question twice and things like that. Um, so, okay, great. So take it away and let the games begin. <laughs> okay. Well, um, in preparing for what's new, kind of talking about what's new, I, I had a few things and here they are. Um, the first one is this uh, 462 C. This is the one I'll spend most of the time on. Um, but before I'm done, I also want to mention other new products that uh, people might be interested in and in passing. And if anybody has an interest in anything that I mentioned, jot it down. You can go to the QHY website or, or contact uh, Woodland Hills and uh, they can tell you about it. Um, the, the other real exciting camera that's been out for a little while but is still pretty new is the 600. Um, and that is now available in both a, a photo version and a professional version. The 268C is kind of a, a younger brother, not younger, smaller brother, the older but smaller um, than the uh, 600. Very similar, just an APS-C size instead of a uh, 35 millimeter format. Uh, 268M uh, is coming, uh, the monochrome version. The, the 410 is brand new. 410 is basically a uh, uh, back illuminated version of the 128. Uh, and so the 128 is being reduced on account of that release. We have uh, a couple of accessories like the Star Master, which is really exciting. Um, GPS time sync for people doing a little more serious occultation and uh, time domain imaging. And um, finally, I want to mention that we're, are, we're, as I speak this week, we're about to organize uh, an improvement in our uh, US warranty repairs and replacement. So I want to mention that. But to get right down to business, the 462C, now this is the new guy, just released. Uh, a few of these are out already in the field, have been tested, and dealers now have first ones arriving just, you know, in the last week or so. 
So unfortunately, it's so new, I don't have any images from it yet, except test images they did uh, that, you know, to, just to, to make sure it was working. But I don't have any uh, users' uh, uh, planetary images yet. I was hoping. Real Chris quick, got one. Yeah, I was going to say so um, I spoke to Chris. Yeah. Um, he said he just picked it up. So he wasn't able to shoot anything to get it out for today. Yeah. Because if he did, he would have joined us for this. Okay. Well, that's so, too bad. I, Chris is a good guy. He's a great planetarian. Oh, yeah. He's, he's one of the best. <laughs> now, he's been using the QHY 290C. Um, and this camera, the 462C, uh, architecturally is the same. It's the same pixel size, the same sensor size. In fact, it looks like the same sensor only improved in the 462 version. So in terms of imaging, um, field of view, whatnot, it'll be absolutely identical to what he's already got, just more sensitive. So um, here it is. And uh, uh, what makes it uh, kind of special? Well, this is a sixth generation Exmor R Starvis CMOS sensor. Now that's a lot of, that's a lot of <laughs> trade names. So if we unpack it, um, Exmor means, uh, Exmor is Sony's uh, trade name for technical improvements to CMOS chips, where they added A to D converters for every column of a pixel and two-step noise reduction instead of one. And this really dramatically improved uh, CMOS sensors for work like astronomy, where they really need it. Really need it. Um, Exmor R is the back illuminated version of the Exmor. Starvis is uh, kind of shorthand for starlight visibility. And um, for Sony, of course, the big thing is uh, security cameras. And uh, they've they added Starvis to these security cameras um, as a trade name to, to imply that it can take images, video images, by starlight, which, of course, also implies you can take star images with it. Um, and the sixth generation, of course, has all the improvements of generations one through five. And in order to really understand the sixth, I kind of want to go through what those improvements were step by step. So you can see how it's accumulated in the sixth generation. So um, the, the improvements are really mostly at the pixel level. Uh, there is a, another improvement in the sensor design, but a lot of the improvement is at the pixel level. So here's a pixel, or my rendition of a pixel, at least. Um, and uh, so you can kind of follow what we're talking about when I talk about pixel improvements. Um, I want to show, these are actual pixels, uh, to show you where I got my rendition from. And um, the one on the right, far right, I think is a Sony uh, pixel and the one in the middle is another uh, another brand and I can't remember what it was, but um, is this, one, is this, um, this is about five five point five point six microns. So this is a micro photograph of a cross section of a pixel. Um, so when we talk about the pixels and the improvements, these are the these are the things to keep in mind. Here are the micro lenses. This is where the light gets focused down into the pixel wall. Uh, underneath the micro lenses, you have a RGB filter layer. That's for color uh, color imagers. Now, if it's a monochrome camera, this layer is not there, or it's clear. Um, below that, on in a typical pixel. Um, you have the metal wiring in the silicone substrate. Now this is this is as if you had cut off a concrete block under your house and it had pipes in it. And you're seeing the ends of the pipes where you cut it off with the concrete all around it. So this is this is the silicone and, and these are the ends of the wires that got hacked off when they sliced through the pixel. Wires are obviously opaque. So when light comes in, if it hits the wires, it doesn't get recorded down in the photosites. And photosites are down here. So the photosensitive layer of a pixel traditionally has been below the uh, silicone substrate and the wiring. Um, so for light to come in, it has to be you know, angled down into the pixel, miss the wiring, and hit the photosite. And so you can see there's a, a high percentage of chance that light coming in doesn't hit the photosite. If it hits this, it gets reflected or absorbed. It doesn't make it down here. And get recorded as an electron. 
Um, and also the angle makes a difference. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But in the early days, and like I said, I've been around imaging for a long time. When, when CMOS uh, sensors first came out and people were trying to apply them to astronomy, we kind of laughed because they were so noisy that nobody would want them. They were ter terrible noise uh, specifications. And we just thought they're, they're never going to be. Uh, nobody's going to want them. CCDs were. But uh, Sony also uh, knew that, and they wanted to make some changes. And the first change they made was in, at the sensor level. And I'll go through this. this I don't want this to be a class, but, uh, but just, to, just to get you an idea of what they're doing. If, if this is a pixel, here's, a, here's an array of pixels. This is a sensor. And, um, uh, and so what happens is the pixels fill up with uh, electrons. And they're captured here in the photodiodes. They go in, but they don't come out until you want them to. And then each one of these uh, pixels, which has now got a different number of electrons in them for the different brightnesses and whatnot, um, have to get read out somehow. You have to understand how many electrons are in each one. And so the way they do it is they shift, the, uh, they, they read out a, a horizontal row of pixels here, one by one bucket brigade style into a analog to digital converter, and they're converted to a digital signal. Before that, it's analog. To get it down to here, they have to shift pixel by pixel through a noise reduction technique called correlated double sampling, where they sample it twice and correlate the results to make sure they aren't getting some curious number. So this reduces noise a little bit, but you've got an analog signal being shifted pixel by pixel through the circuits down through a, a CDS, and then you still got an analog signal here being shifted out pixel by pixel until finally one analog converter converts every pixel one at a time into a digital signal. So all of this did two things. It, it left a lot of room for noise to enter the analog signal before it got converted to digital. And it, there was a bottleneck here that caused a, a limit to the, the um, rate at which you could read them out. And so what Sony did was they took that analog to digital converter and they put one on every column of pixels instead of one for the whole sensor. Now they read them out in parallel. At the same time, they can read out all the columns at the same time. They do correlated double sampling as they did before, before it goes into the A to D. Then they do it again when it comes out of the A to D. And now they shift out a digital signal that's already been digitized. Um, and so what this does is the parallel structure makes it a lot faster. Uh, digitizing it early in the sequence makes it a lot less noisy and doing uh, noise reduction both before and after the conversion makes it much, much less noisy. So now you've got a very clean digital signal coming out at a fast rate, which is what CMOSes uh, are known for. This is Sony's invention, and this was the original Exmor design. Pixels uh, in the original design used uh, aluminum wiring in the uh, substrate. So to improve things then, in the second generation, uh, they shifted from aluminum wiring to copper. And the reason for that is they could make the copper wires thinner. By making it thinner, they could make this distance from the bottom of the micro lens to the photosites shorter than the distance with the aluminum wires. So shorter distance meant the photons have to travel through less muck to get to the photosite. And there's a better chance that uh, photons coming in at an angle, like if a photon comes in at an angle here, and gets refracted, maybe it hits this wiring and doesn't get recorded. Now it comes in, same angle, it's got a better chance that it's gonna miss the wiring and get down to the photosite. So this improved sensitivity uh, by making the uh, substrate thinner. Third generation is really the same thing, only better. Um, I've got a scorecard over here. So now we've got parallel A to Ds, better digitization, and we've got a smaller uh, wiring system that lets more photons get recorded by the photosite. So far, all these are incremental improvements in um, shorter wavelengths. Uh, blue, blue, green tend to be affected most by having this deep angle made uh, uh, more accessible to those wavelengths of light because they get refracted uh, more than the red and infrared. Plus, infrared has another 
uh, issue in that it likes to travel a long distance through the photodiode before it can record an, uh, an electron, before it produces an electron. And the possibility exists that uh, you can get a nice infrared signal in here, but it wants to go so deep that you don't get an electron from it, it doesn't record it. So to answer that, the Sony made the fourth generation, which is just like the third, but with a deeper, physically deeper uh, photodiode. So now there's a better chance that an infrared wavelength uh, photon is gonna generate an electron. And in fact, it does. It's much, much more sensitive than the third generation in IR. This of course makes a great surveillance camera because it's more sensitive at night. Um, and so far, all these improvements have been with uh, front illuminated sensors up until here. Um, and then the big change came, I think this was 2008, I'm not sure, uh, when they introduced back illuminated sensors. Now, back illuminated has been known in the CCD world for a long time, but it hadn't been applied to CMOS sensors yet. And what, what it is, is they, they flip the photodiode and the circuitry so that the photodiodes are above the circuitry. And essentially, you turn the sensor around so that the light comes in from this direction instead of this direction. And what that does is now you don't have the wiring in the way. So instead of banging in the wiring, photons can make it all the way down to the photocells. This, in effect, doubled the sensitivity of the sensor because you've got twice the, twice the area now available not being occluded by wiring that's opaque. But if you'll notice my scorecard over here, I've grayed out the improvement we got in the fourth generation of sensor. And in the drawing, you can see this pixel looks more like this one, not like this one. So this improvement in the fifth generation is really back illuminated version of what was in the third. It didn't have the IR sensitivity improvement that they saw in the fourth. All the wavelengths were improved, but the IR they really wanted to nail for their uh, surveillance work. So they came out with the sixth generation, which following uh, logically, they made it deeper pixel, deeper pixel wells, deeper fo uh, photodiodes, but up here under the micro lenses. Now you've got higher sensitivity in the blue, in the green, in the red, and in the infrared. And you've got faster, lower noise um, uh, sensors. So this is, these are all the improvements up to generation six which is what the 460 is. Now, what does that mean? If you look at the QE curves of uh, typical color sensors, they kind of look like this. Um, unfortunately, we Sony doesn't give out absolute QE uh, numbers for their sensors. They always talk about relative QE. And usually they, they, they say this is one, not 100, this is one, this is 0.5, like that. The reason is they, they are showing what the relative QE is from one wavelength to another or from one color to another. But they don't give you what the absolute is. So some, you always see these QEs with a QE of one over here. And it just means that's the highest. But uh, in order to determine what that is in absolute numbers, we have to compare it to other sensors like we did with the 600 to come up with an absolute number. In this case, we haven't done that rigorous test yet, but we have a pretty good idea from others that have uh, done some testing and we're estimating this represents, fairly represents what the QE is in the, in the visual range. Likewise, uh, with this new sixth generation sensor, it happens normally in the sensors that aren't uh, you, uh, IR sensitive, this red curve kind of goes down pretty much straight line. So it gets down here about a thousand where it's almost, almost zero. That, this is a usual curve for uh, a sensor sensitivity in the near IR. But this sensor, the sixth generation sensors, now have a peak Q in the near IR that's as higher, higher than it is in the visual. And, um, and this is phenomenal. I mean, uh, up here is pretty much you know, insane. Now you see that the, the curves start to kind of blend together here. Right about 850, these curves become a single line to get there all the same. The reason for that is the the filters that are on the pixels of this chip are um, organic dye filters that are very sensitive, uh, very uh, efficient in the visual. But when you get into the IR, they become transparent. 
So really about 850 of these, these filters become clear to IR light. So basically from 850 up, you get a sensor that where every pixel is seeing uh, IR light the same. The, the RGB filters have essentially disappeared uh, as far as the light is concerned. So uh, that makes it really nice for uh, planetary imagers because uh, you want methane image in the methane band that's about 890 nanometers right here. High QE, all the pixels in white right light. You want to image in normal visual color. Uh, we, we supply UV IR filter that will separate out this portion of the spectrum, block the near IR so you don't get contamination. If you want to image in IR, we also supply an, a, an IR850 filter which blocks everything below 850 and passes all this above 850. And again, if you're a planetary imager and you use a methane filter, this is kind of where a methane filter sits um, right here. So it's, a, it's an excellent camera, we think, for planetary imagers. Another thing that uh, the sixth generation has that is uh, rather new, high gain, uh, high conversion gain has been around a little bit. Uh, on other sensors, they get sensors down to the one electron range with their high conversion gain. In the sixth generation sensor, Sony calls it super high conversion gain because it's even better. And what super high conversion gain uh, does is gives you a very, very low read noise at high gain. Here's the low gain of the 462 sensor. This is at gain zero, no gain at all. It's only 2.6 electrons. <laughs> I mean that's laughingly low from a from a, somebody coming from the CCD world, you know, uh, and that's just to start with. So in low gain, you're always in a couple of electron uh, range, and when you go to high gain, what happens is it immediately drops to one electron and goes down from there. I mean the highest gain uh, this camera can achieve is up in this range where the the read noise is half an electron. That's phenomenally low, and what that does is it lets someone take hundreds or thousands of short, fast planetary images, uh, combine them to get the best result and not add a lot of noise in the process. If you're adding a, a sensor that has two, three electrons and taking thousands of images, uh, you get a lot more noise than if you're adding images that are half an electron. So that's really another reason why this is really uh, planetary images for light. The dynamic range does something funny too. I, this range, these are photo stops, I think. But what happens is right here, where you change from from low gain to high gain at around 100, the dynamic range goes up. So you drop from two electrons read noise to one electron read noise, and although the full well went down slightly, it didn't go down as much as the read noise did. And so you, you actually get more dynamic range, lower read noise uh, when at, at the conversion point which is an excellent result. Now, what this means in terms of, uh, I wish I had more planetary cameras, but this is a test shot that was done uh, on the bench. This is, a, this is the 290 uh, and this is the 462. Same pixel size, and same sensor size, same exposure time, same lighting, uh, everything's the same, but this is the difference in, in brightness you get from these two sensors. So this is kind of an indication of how much better the 462 is going to perform um, based on its new technology. So some key specs uh, for planetary imagers. It's got uh, uh, 2.9 micron pixels, same as the 290, which are uh, high resolution. Uh, it will produce HD uh, resolution images, 1920 by 1080. Um, read noise, we discussed. 2.6 down to half an electron, high QE, um, 135 frames a second per frame, full resolution, um, and higher at selected regions of interest. So, and it supports you can pick any area of the sensor, and if it's smaller than a full frame, it'll be faster. Uh, it fits in an inch and a quarter eyepiece holder and only weighs three ounces. So, it's a, a great handy camera. It comes with all this. It comes with a focusing uh, ring. You can put the ring on and, and lock it down. So if you find a good spot where it focuses in your eyepiece holder, it'll stay there. Next time you put it in, it's in the same place. Um, a a C-mount adapter. I think this is C-mount. It's a quarter ring that goes on the bottom. 
might be CS. Uh, two I'm filters. Sorry, I gotta yep. say this. I have always wondered what that ring is. This one? The, the blue the blue ring, the one above it. I have oh. always wondered what that was. Well now you know. Now I know. <laughs> I never knew <laughs> that. I, I used to, I used to open them up and they're like, what is this for? I couldn't figure it out. Now I know. Uh, we used we used to have eyepieces that were kind of par focal with the camera and we'd put an eyepiece in to find an object uh, in the telescope, take the eyepiece out, put the camera in. In order to get the camera back to focus, we'd have to mark a little mark on the side of it to know that you, you just slide it in and out. You don't want to ruin the focus of the eyepiece. Right. You know, you so you just slide the camera in after the mark and then lock it down and now you're good. Well, now, it, now it's just automatic. Oh, you could just drop it right in. Drop it right in and there you go. <laughs> I've never known that. <laughs> now I know. So um, here's your IR850 uh, IR and a UV IR filter included with the camera, the USB cable and a, a guiding cable. This camera also operate as a guider and uh, the whole system is uh, 399 same same price basically as the, the, the so that's the 462 um, next we go to the big boys we go to the other end of the scale I mean that was a small small planetary camera the the 600s are the full frame 35 millimeter size serious uh, deep space cameras, and um, there's two versions of it. There's a pro version and a photo version. The difference is in the features of the camera, but not in the image. The image quality is identical. You can't tell one from another. There's no difference in the uh, imaging electronics of the camera. So image-wise, they are absolutely the same. The difference is in the interface of the computer and other uh, features, memory features, and add-ons that are uh, friendly to professionals and scientists. And the photo version, because of that, has a longer body than the photo body. Uh, they both use the Sony 455 chip. It's full frame, 35 millimeter size, uh, mono and color, back illuminated, 60 megapixels, one electron and read noise, 90% peak QE. We actually measured the, uh, the absolute QE on this chip. Um, maybe it's not 90, maybe it's 87. It's kind of, it, you know, it's the, the test isn't that accurate, but it's accurate enough. And we compared it to a camera of known QE that uh, we're confident that this is a pretty, uh, a pretty accurate number. 16 bit A to D, real 16 bits off of the chip. Uh, the eight, all those A to Ds that were in the parallel columns, they're all 16 bit A to Ds. Not 14, and it's got low dark current. Um, the real difference now between the photo and the professional model is this: the photo model has got uh, a USB 3, you know, power, and it's got the normal QHY four-pin filter rule. The professional version adds two 10 gigabit optical fiber ports for faster downloads. It also has USB 3, so you can use either one. Uh, it's got a program, a filter wheel port. It's got a programmable I.O. port. Now, this is a little six pin port um, that lets you do all kinds of things with the camera. You can sync, you know, multiple cameras up to go off at the same time. You can have a you know, trigger in and out. You can hook up a GPS unit to it. There's all kinds of things you can do. The camera has a large uh, available resource of memory in the camera for programming by professionals and scientists in the FPGA. So things that they need to be done specially, they can, they can program the camera to do it. That's the real difference between the photo and the professional model. Um, in terms of output, the USB 3 will do uh, two and a half frames a second, 16 bit, 60 mega, uh, megapixels. The um, two time, times 10 gigabit will do four frames at 16 bits or 10 frames at 14, or it'll do 30 frames a second, 8K video. Now, one thing to keep in mind, the 10 gigabit optical fiber interface is available, but in order for it to work, you have to uh, get an optional uh, card from QHY. It's a plug-in PCIe grabber card. It costs about a thousand bucks. So um, this camera, a lot, some scientists don't don't care about the speed so much, so they don't need to buy the card. Or you might have 
two or three cameras. You only need one card if you only run it one at a time. That's why the card is sold uh, separately or not at all if you don't need it. <clears throat> the um, fiber optic interface, uh, it, that one of the reasons the camera is longer is that these go inside the camera, they go in those ports and these are the transmitters for the optical fiber. This is the grabber card that goes in your PC. And you could run, you know, 300 meters of optical fiber instead of 15 feet of USB cable. So if you need to move the camera a long distance away from the computer, this is a good, uh, a good solution. Uh, I do have sample images from this camera. This is one taken by by Matt Dahl. This is a nice M31. Um, the thing about this is it's one frame. It's not it's not a mosaic. He did this all one all in one shot. It's uh, <clears throat> multiple you know, exposures, but it's all a single frame taken with a five inch telescope. So the the 35 millimeter size uh, sensor is really handy for taking you know, wider field images with smaller scope. Um, this is that horse head image that I mentioned to you before, Simon. This is uh, H alpha taken through a Celestron uh, 11 inch Rossoscope. Now I've never seen, I've never seen a horse head image like this. <laughs> oh, I've, I've got to admit, I, I've never seen, I mean, it helps to have the 11 inches to resolve this, <laughs> but that is, do you know what the integration time in this is? I do. Um, this was, Taken with a Celestron 11 inch Rasta, it's 20 frames, 21 minutes each. 21 minutes per frame? Yeah. Well, I mean, of course, because you're using an F2, so it's going to get away with any. It's just how absurd. <laughs> <laughs> and that's through, it's through a three and a half uh, nanometer uh, H alpha filter. So, I, to me, this blows me away. Every time I look at it, I just. I, I, <laughs> Anyway, that, there you go. Um, this was taken by Wu Sheng in China. Uh, it was processed by um, Dr. Lau. I don't know him, but his name is often on the credits, so I don't want to go by without mentioning his name. Because I'm sure the processing had a lot to do with the final result. Uh, okay, moving on. Um, the, the prices for these cameras, the QHY 600, the professional version is $79.95 and the photographic version is $44.99. Okay, I've got a quick question that is related to the uh, 600. Um, does the two gigabyte of RAM get fully utilized if the USB 3 connection to the computer or is there an overflow if the connection is slow? Um, yeah, no, it, it, the, the two gigabytes is enough to handle uh, USB uh, problems. It's better, obviously, never to have a busy USB when you're trying to download 60 megapixels of data in a hurry. But the reason that the buffer is there is so that if there is, if there are interruptions, uh, it continues on without losing the frame. So it's it's meant to handle um, hiccups in the USB. But uh, so. Uh, just out of interest, um, I mean, for those of you who probably don't understand some of this stuff, but um, we know that the file size is of a certain size. You know, it even says it's 51 megapixels. So we're dealing with a uh, file size that could be like 26 megabytes in size. So how exactly does that buffer um, utilize itself to feed that information off? Because that's obviously one of these things that a lot of people ask about because some other companies may not even have a buffer that big because they think that their USB bandwidth is big enough to allow for this kind of throughput. Yeah, it, the problem is when the USB hiccups and then uh, if you can't reconnect and establish the continuation of the data stream from exactly where it left off, you lose the frame. Uh, two gigabytes is plenty to hold um, the, the uh, image. The image size, I think it's, uh, it's I forget, two bytes per bit or bits per byte, I'm not an engineer, but I think this 60 uh, megapixel has 120 um, uh, bits or bytes. Uh, so the image size is 120 uh, megabytes, but the buffer is two gigabytes. So it's got plenty of buffer to hold multiple frames. So what happens is the frame comes off the sensor as it's read out, digitized, uh, and it goes immediately into the buffer where it's transferred from the buffer through the USB to the 
computer. Now, if the computer hiccups, it's still in the buffer. So it, uh, it you know, it's got error correction to, to catch where it uh, left off and then continues on. So you don't lose the frame. Uh, that was the that was the whole point of having a big buffer. Right. You could, have, so, you could have you could have just one buffer, but then you can only hold one frame at a time. Right. And and here and this camera was designed ultimately for the for the professional guy that is going to be doing uh, 8K video <laughs> at 30 frames a second, uh, each frame 120 megabytes. So just just to translate that for you guys out there, uh, it's common to see something like the 174, the 290, especially when you're doing planets is you're going at like breakneck speeds to try and get like 200 frames a second or, or less, so to speak. And the most common killer is frame drops. And you'll, if you're using sharp cap, you'll see that on the bottom, it reports the frame drops. And that's exactly what this problem is. The USB gets oversaturated, cannot pull the data down and the buffer is overflowed. So that's why these cameras and this is actually unique to QHY600 from what I know is they are the only people that have the two gigabyte buffers. Everybody else seems to use less. At least from what I remember anyway, but this is well, all new stuff. Like I say, the, the 600 was really designed from the get go to be a professional camera. For right. time. So a lot of stuff was added that, that, was, that they could then remove make a photo version because you didn't need it. Uh, the, I think there's a difference in the, the, I can't remember, it's this model or another. They might have reduced the buffer to a gigabyte. This, yeah, I believe so. Version. Yeah, but I mean, still a gigabyte is plenty. Uh, right. I mean, the funny, the funny thing here is though, there are a lot of people who use red cameras um, to do uh, video astronomy in 8K. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's, a, it's amazing stuff. I'm not ready to drop twenty thousand dollars on it, but at you know four and a bit, it's doable. You know, suddenly we've now got the ability to do eight K video. I did a uh, comparison. I don't want to mention the brand name because I don't know where I stand legally on it. But there is a camera out there, uh, a new camera by a very high end um, uh, manufacturer uh, that costs seventy thousand dollars, and um, I, I took a look at the specs and I put them side by side with the 600 and there are some areas obviously where the $70,000 camera beats it. Um, but by and large, most of the key specs, um, QHY is better and than a $70,000 scientific camera. Now, it may be that one thing that where it doesn't beat it is what you want and, and you've got a government uh, budget and, and so you buy the $70,000 camera, but for a lot of work, the 600 is every bit as good as professional cameras costing many mm -hmm. times more. Right. All right, sorry. Yep, we can okay. carry on now. No, no problem. All right, go on to the next camera is the 268C. This is kind of the smaller brother of the 600. Um, it, it has the same uh, two, uh, uh, versions. It's got a professional version and a photo version. It's got an APS-C size sensor, but otherwise it's very similar. It's the same pixel architecture, you know, same kind of QE, read noise, everything. It's just a smaller version of it in APS size. Uh, it uses a 571 sensor, APS-C, like I said. Now the difference between APS-C and 35 is about 80, APS-C is about 80%, maybe the size of a 35 millimeter sensor. Uh, so it's a little bit smaller. A lot of people like APS-C because it doesn't tax their system as much. You can use 50 millimeter filters without worrying about vignetting no matter where they are. Uh, you don't have to worry about your telescope uh, image circle being you know big enough to cover 35 without problems on the edges and that. So APS-C is kind of handy um, and it, it's the same, same features. It's back illuminated, it's 26 megapixels instead of 61. It's 16 bits, one electron in noise, high QE. Um, and uh, this is a this is a horse head by Jarrett Trezzo that was taken. This is with, uh, also with an 11 inch Rasa. This is only two hours. But yeah, yeah, I'm sorry to say the 600 blows that one out. Well, the, yeah, I, you put them <laughs> side by side isn't fair. <laughs> But, but the thing about this, the reason I wanted to mention this one is because he took this there, all, 
it's two hours of total exposure time, but no exposure over one minute long. Well, yeah. He took a bunch of one minute images. I mean, we just never did that in CCD imaging. We always wanted to bake in the image for a long time to get the highest signal noise. Now with the low read noise of the camera, that's, uh, that's not something you need to do. Uh, it, this is another 268 uh, image by Jarrett. This is uh, an E3. This is taken with a 10 inch Orion Newtonian scope. Um, again, a bunch of two and three minute images added together. So the 268 is a handy little camera. Um, it's uh, a lot like the 600 in performance, just a smaller size sensor. Um, and it's priced half the price. Uh, the photo version is 2095, the pro version is 2995. And there's a monochrome version of it coming out, which will be the smaller brother to the 600 monochrome in October. Just to put this into perspective real quick, um, that particular camera is going to be the camera that replaces the 1600 from anybody's camera. Um, doesn't matter who makes it. So it's, if you're familiar with it, and pretty much anybody and everybody has had a 1600, which is the Panasonic chip, um, this thing, just so you guys know, is going to be the replacement for that camera. So if you're looking for an upgrade um, and don't want to fork out 600 Q8 to 600 money, this is actually the best camera, from my perspective at least anyway, for everybody to go with. Um, there's actually one little feature that I'm going to talk about that I don't know if you're going to cover, so I'm going to wait till the very end before I say okay. anything. All right. Um, this is another new product. I got a, now I got a leaf blower coming, so if you hear it, I apologize, but I, I, he's not on my property, so I can't stop him. Um, the 410C. Now, the 410 is, if you're familiar with the QHY128, um, which was a front illuminated full frame color sensor. It was actually the sensor used in the Nikon G750, I think, if I remember right. Um, that was the 128. Well, the Sony's made a back illuminated version, basically, of that sensor. Same pixel size, same format, uh, full frame, 35 millimeter, 28 megapixels, uh, 5.96 micron pixels. So they're a little bigger than a lot of the new sensors they've been coming out with. And, uh, and we're suspecting this is going to be the most sensitive full frame color camera for astrophotography because of the larger pixel size and the back illumination. Uh, full frame, 35 millimeter. It, there'll be a pro version, a photo version. The photo version is going to be 3695, available soon, probably in the next month or two. And the pro version is, uh, they're still working on it. So we'll announce that when we've got more details. Um, on account of that, the 128, which is the front illuminated version of that sensor that we were just mentioning in the 410, um, has been reduced in price. It was $34.99, so we're going to keep it in the lineup, but drop the price to $26.95 um, to kind of fill in the gaps between the lowest price uh, big frame cameras and the highest price cameras. Uh, we want to give everybody a shot, and budget might be a consideration. And if it is, this will still be there. Um, oh, this is the lineup. This is what I meant by the lineup. We, we've got, we've got, these are all APS-C and full frame size sensors. These are, it, to me, these are the big ones that, you know, not the four thirds and smaller. We've got a four thirds camera that's like a thousand bucks. And then there are all the smaller versions, the uh, 183s and whatnot that are less than a thousand. So there are lower price cameras, but in large, you pay for real estate when you buy a camera. And then if you're buying sensor size, then you, if you want an APS-C or a full frame sensor, this is this is uh, a lineup. You would now have a choice of uh, prices from 1,700 to you know 4,500, uh, and a lot of choices in between. It's not just one big jump. I, I kind of laugh sometimes. I, I, I you know listen to the to the bulletin, the, the, you know, the groups and, and some guys wank about the price of cameras and how expensive they are and everything. I went back and looked at prices um, for the 11,000 camera. When we first came out with an 11,000 camera at my previous company, 
company. Um, I've still got all the old prices and everything. But the 11,000 camera, which is, is not half the performance of uh, any of these full frame chips, sold for the $7,000 range. On sale, it was you know, $6,000, $7,000. Um, lower QE, higher read noise, extremely slow readout. These are these are faster, more sensitive, better, lower noise, and and even the 600 Pro <laughs> with all of its features is about the same price as the old 11,000 was 20 years ago. So I, I I don't I don't have a lot of sympathy for people that complain about the, the price of cameras. This is expensive, yeah, but but compared to what you get and what you used to get, it's hands down better. Um, off my pedestal for a moment. So th this is something a lot of people have asked about and I want to throw it in to let you know it's coming. Ooh, okay, uh, back off. If, um, <laughs> you didn't answer the question. Okay, um, go back to the slide that shows the front of any other cameras that you just talked about. Okay, that will do. Um, there is one key feature that I will point out that uh, Mike didn't actually mention about QHY cameras is the fact that they do not use an actual screw-in uh, mount type. They use a dovetail mount type for one sole main purpose is you can reorientate the camera in any uh, direction you want within the system. So if you have an off-axis guider, a filter wheel, and all this other stuff, uh, what you'll find with some of these other companies is these things never seem to line up in the right place. And when you screw something in instinctively where the threads land, the sensor might be in a bad orientation and there is no way for you to correct it. So this is where QHY have kind of gone one step beyond that uh, from the hardware standpoint and put the dovetail attachment in there to allow you to rotate the camera in any orientation so you will never have an obstruction in the system. Yeah, you can't you can't see it on this picture, but you can see the, the what, where it is. Uh, th this piece right here with the three uh, thumb screws sits over the dovetail. There's a underneath here. There's a there's a, a round dovetail piece. So if the camera's in a if the sensor is oriented this way and you want it oriented this way, you just loosen these up, you rotate the camera, tighten them up, put it anywhere you want. Yeah, I, I think that to me is a really important feature. And I think a lot of people miss the fact that it does this. Um, and I always like to point it out because it is a big deal, at least to me it is anyway, because there is nothing more irritating than trying to get an off-axis guider to orientate in such a way where it doesn't obstruct the sensor. And if you're cursed in a situation where your threads land in a bad position, and then you're given these little tiny thin um, things that you have to keep threading in there and turning it, unthreading it, turning it, unthreading it. Um, it, it it's a nightmare. It, I wish other people would adopt this system more readily in the um, in the CMOS world, at least. Because CCDs, they've been doing this for a long, long time. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Um, yeah, this um, this is something all the cam all the size cameras have that. Um, this by and it can be it can be removed by the way. Some people yeah, of course. have a solid connection and they know how to line up their you know mechanical drawings so all their holes are in the right orientation. They'd rather not have a dovetail where it's just another piece that they have to deal with. Take it off. It can be taken off. Those holes are there. Can be done without. But if you want it, it's there. So there's always a choice. Uh, okay, where where did I land? Oh, here I was. Oh, the East Star Master. Star um, Master. This, they, this, QHY started with the Star Master some time ago. This is, this is I, I should start out by saying the form factor of the Star Master that's about to come out may be different than this. It might not look exactly the same, but this gives you an idea of what we're working with. It's very small. It's a couple inches uh, square. Uh, it, it's got uh, uh, software. It's, it's a Raspberry Pi. Um, inside, it's got um, software that will run cameras, not just QHY cameras, but any camera that's in the list of uh, supported uh, brands. So if you've got a QHY camera and a XYZ uh, guider, you can run them at the same time. Uh, mounts, different mounts, focusers, guiders, 
it's not, it'll have wireless capability, it'll have power ports and all that. And it's going to be in the, you know, a couple hundred dollar range uh, when it comes out. And it'll be out real soon, probably in the next couple of months. So uh, keep an eye out for this. Uh, time sync, this is more for like more serious uh, guys doing uh, time domain imaging, if they're doing occultation timing, um, or if you need to synchronize multiple cameras. If you use this time sync, um, you can synchronize cameras that have the, that are compatible with this box, uh, which are all the QHY cameras that have that six pin, I should, oh, this is a mistake. I should say six pin for it, not four pin. Um, uh, and you can synchronize the cameras to all go off at the same time. You can, you can take exposures and have very, very accurate timing of those exposures. This, this technique of GPS timing uh, and having a hardware timestamp on the frame uh, is what was used by the group of uh, amateurs and professionals that did the uh, occultation timing for uh, Ultima Thule. That, that uh, body in the Kuiper belt that's out a billion miles past Pluto, uh, that uh, New Horizon spacecraft was going to visit. And um, it, if you don't remember, the New Horizon spacecraft went to see Pluto and it took pictures of Pluto and everything. And, and as it sped by Pluto on its way out of the solar system, the next body that it came to, that it could come to, was uh, Pluto's three billion miles, by the way. This guy's four billion miles, another billion miles, and he's about ten miles across this this planet, <laughs> this planetoid, this asteroid. And they wanted to know before they sent the spacecraft to go look at it if it was dangerous or not, whether there was a, a debris around it, you know, kind of what, you know, where, what it was. What you know, they they wanted to get a little more information before they just drove right at it. So fifty, a, a group of uh, fifty more than 50, I think, amateurs and professionals got data from European Space Agency and elsewhere uh, to, to do a track on the Earth of the shadow of this small body passing in front of a star, uh, knowing where it would be on the Earth, you know, in several different places on the Earth. And their idea was to go out and set up a bunch of telescopes uh, around the planet and, and track the occultation, which would last maybe one or two seconds at best, time it, and then see if they could coordinate all of this data and come up with uh, an accurate image of the planet based upon its combined shadow data. They tried it first, and because their, error, their data was off a little bit, they missed it. They tried it again with the um, NASA spacecraft, can't remember the name of it right now, it's the 747 that has the hole in the back and that big telescope. Um, yeah, it was flying out, it, so it was out there taking an image and it missed it by, by that much, <laughs> as Maxwell Smart would say. And um, finally, the third try, they had uh, imagers in uh, South America and South Africa, I believe, uh, in, in a bunch of pairs with Dobsonian scopes and a QHY camera that had a, a time sync. They, they took, they caught it, they caught the occultation. And by timing when it started and when it stopped and knowing where they were on the earth, they could develop this picture of the shadow, of how the shadow looked on the earth. And from that shadow, they could tell what the object actually looked like. And they came up with this dumbbell shape, these two lobes that were together, uh, about 10 miles across. And when uh, New Horizons got to the asteroid, it took a picture of it, and it was exactly the same shape as all these amateurs predicted from four billion miles away with a one or two second occultation time. And it was only made possible because the timing was so accurate, and that is done by GPS stamping. That's what this will do. Um, last thing I wanted to mention, I put it on my list in the beginning, and we're just about out of time anyway. Um, is uh, North American warranty repairs and replacements. One of the complaints we always get is that if I've got a camera made overseas, I don't like to have to send it overseas to get it fixed. It takes too long, it's too far away, it's too expensive. And we've been working on that problem uh, step by step. For a while now, my company, Santa Barbara Scientific, 
already handles uh, replacements for warranty. So if somebody gets a new camera and for any reason there's something wrong with it uh, right away in the first you know, 30, 60 days, we've got replacements handy in the United States, we can do a fast swap so they don't have to wait. Um, it's a little bit more difficult when there's a repair, a warranty repair or out of warranty. In that case, they can still send it to, uh, to me, but I, in that case, send it back to the factory for repairs. Well, that's also taking longer than we'd like. And we were just yesterday, in fact, uh, talking, uh, I think finalized uh, the framework for establishing a repair facility in the United States. So in the very near future, we'll have all of our warranty and out of warranty repairs done here, along with replacements done here. So when somebody buys a camera, even though it's made overseas, um, they, you know, all, all of the service and warranty will be handled. So it'll be faster and better for the customer. So I just wanted to mention that because that's a that's a big issue for a lot of people. And I think that's the end of my slideshow. Awesome. All right. So we're going to open this up for questions now. Bearing in mind, obviously there is a delay, so I got to wait for the uh, the chat to catch up with the video feed or whichever way around you want to look at it. So if you guys got questions, feel free to fire them off. Um, Mike, um, I know that this has been a common question that I personally get asked from um, various people is, is there some type of program that they can get with QHY to become a tester? There's no, um, there's no uh, official program. There's nothing um, uh, structured. But, they, but QHY does like testers. They do like to get the cameras out to testers. Um, so if someone wants to be a tester, my suggestion is uh, they just they can write to me if they want. I'll pass it along. Um, you can reach me at QHYUSA at gmail.com. Easy to remember. Um, or QHYCCD at gmail. Those both come to me. And uh, if you want to test cameras, let me know. Um, give me a little bit of history about yourself. We want people that test cameras uh, that, that kind of know what they're doing. Um, I don't mean that as an insult, but it just it does no good for anybody if somebody's brand new imaging and they're still learning about cameras and they're testing a the camera and then they say, hey, I got this problem. And we have to first figure out if it's a camera problem or a pilot problem and uh, get somebody with some experience, then we're more comfortable that when they find a problem, it's really something wrong with the camera and we can address it without spending a lot of time trying to figure out if, if something else is going on. So that's all. Uh, we like testers. Um, uh, let me know and I'll pass your name along. Yeah, and if you guys do want to test a camera, um, obviously we can't just hand any camera out to you right off the bat, but if you had one in mind, feel free to contact myself as well. Uh, you can find me at uh, the store there's thousands of ways to contact me over there, so take your pick. Um, yeah, just let me know, and then I can pass the information on to Mike, who can then go through and do their vetting process. Um, so more for me than anything else, while I wait for a question to come in, I do a lot of solar photography. Um, and to me, the 174 uh, CCD is just aged beyond belief. It, it's like a lower resolution camera by today's standard. And there was one of the cameras that you mentioned with the five point something uh, micron, 5.9 micron pixel size, which kind of like made my ears prick up. Is there a monochrome version in the works of that one? That one is color. That was the, um, the uh, 410 and the one, 128. Uh, it, Sony usually, in, in this kind of camera that for because they're used uh, commercially, they, they come out with the color first. Mm -hmm. and then they will produce a monochrome version that they think there's a market for. It. Um, so there isn't at the moment, but uh, if they do make a monochrome version of the 410, um, it would have everything you need. It, it's a big chip, so it probably wouldn't have the frame rates of a couple hundred frames a second that you're used to with a small chip. Um, but uh, you know, it's got, it'll have everything else and you can always do a region of interest that'll speed up the frame rate. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I mean, ultimately, I mean, ultimately there is, there, go ahead. There, there is a camera coming out that has very, that's very similar in size to the 178. 
ones, and I don't have it yet because I don't have all the details yet. But it's Wait, the one. Same. 178 or the 174? Uh, 174, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, but I think it has smaller pixels now, but you can bin those pixels. And uh, I'll have to look and see what size they are. Um, it's just in the back of my mind. I, I've got to go look up the details, but it may be a good, uh, a good option for you. Binning, by the way, um, I, I'll talk to THY a little bit about it. Binning right now is normally done in software. So uh, although you get a lot of results from binning, it doesn't speed up the frame transfer process. Whereas if you bin on chip, it does speed up the right. transfer process. So there are there are some areas where uh, maybe they can do some engineering to uh, come up with cameras that have bigger pixels and faster frame rates. Yeah, I mean, there are a couple of um, fun cheats that I've done with other cameras uh, in order to get similar results. I mean, even with anything with 2.9 micron pixel size, uh, again, even if I did binning on that one, that would give me a larger pixel size effectively, what, 5.8, and then try and get the frame rate out of that. But what I would like to try and do is, because there's a lot of images out there that I've come across that seem to all like using large refractors, especially like a 152 or you know anything up above that range, but from a cost standpoint, there is nothing where it can utilize the frame size that we kind of want. And I understand that a lot of these things that we use, like the Quark, for example, has a very small aperture. But I think people are just, are just screaming for a, a slightly larger sensor uh, just to be able to cover more of the sun in one go as opposed to looking at a tiny little you know, area, especially with the 150. It's tricky because there's a built-in 4.2 Barlow inside of it. Um, so we've got a question here. USB 3 versus optical, what can we expect? Well, the optical's faster. There's two, two things about optical fiber. Um, because it's 10 gigabyte, uh, it's, it's faster than USB 3. USB 3 is pretty fast. Optical fiber is faster. So on the big chip, instead of you know whatever it is, uh, I have to go back. Um, Instead of uh, two and a half frames a second at 16 bits with optical fiber, you get four frames a second at 16 bits. So it's not, it's almost not quite twice as fast. Now this is a big chip. On a small chip, it'll be even faster. I mean, to me, the bigger, uh, well, and you get 30K, 30 uh, frames at 8K video which you can't quite get out of USB 3. So optical fiber just makes it faster for video purposes. But more importantly, I think, is you can run 300 meters of cable. You just can't do that with USB 3. USB 3, you got 15 foot cable. If you're lucky, you can put an extension on it. Or you've got to have some relay where you've got a computer at the camera and then you run you know, your local network back to your computer in your warm room or whatever. So if you're away from your telescope, if you're sitting at the telescope, it doesn't matter a lot. If you have a telescope in an observatory and you're on another floor, it matters a great deal. Um, or if your telescope is out in the backyard and you're, you're, you know, you're 50 yards away in the house, you can't run USB that far. See, so, um, this, this for solar, uh, sorry to go back to the solar part, the 30 yeah. frames per second 8K video is already at a massive plus if I was doing solar. Okay. Well, this is a full frame chip, so you should be able to get a, a full. You uh, get a full disc. Full yeah. Disc with a five inch scope. Oh, easy. Yeah. I mean, I got a moon. I, I took a moon, which is the same size as the sun, right? Yeah. I took the moon image full frame with an 11,000, which was a full frame chip and a five inch scope. So with a six inch, you know, you, Put a reducer on it. Maybe you probably squeeze a half a, uh, a half a degree on the on the sensor. Yeah, I'd have to. Ex um, I mean, I would definitely have to take a look into that and experiment with that one because I know there'll be a handful of people that will have a lot of interest in that side of things. Because again, it's far cheaper than trying to buy uh, the red monochrome camera that they have. I think it's called a helium, um, uh, and that thing starts at forty thousand dollars it's just absurd um so yeah this this could be a viable solution 
Uh, I'd have to look into it. I don't know if I'll be able to test anything like this because that means having to wire up a PC with uh, fiber inside of it. And then I have to go get my fiber hub out and all that stuff. I don't want to go down that road <laughs> just yet. Although it looks like um, the connector that you were using is uh, FP, uh, FPS connectors, if you're familiar with fiber. Um, there's a couple of kinds. Um, the, 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 this and this don't match, actually. There, oh, I know. Two, <laughs> this is a single fiber. Um, and this is a double. Yeah. So um, I, I think that QHY is going to supply doubles. Right. Um, so I actually have them. Hold on. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, strangely enough, like I said, I do play around with fiber. Um, I do actually have an FPN, uh, FPS connector. If there this go. camera would focus, come on. Is that a double, double fiber? Yeah. Yeah. Am I stuck on, uh, let's turn this into manual so you guys can see it. So that's actually what this is. Right, yeah, that slips into the back of the camera. That's why the camera is that much longer. It, it needs to need physical space for that to go inside. Um, so with the camera, you'll get those. You'll get two of those. Um, so there's actually two. I've got a bag there. full of these things. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and you'll also get a cable. Um, and then it, it's up to you to decide if or how many of the graphical cards you want if you have more than one camera, et cetera. Now there's another. Th this is I'm, I'm I'm stepping over the line a little bit here. Don't nobody should take this to be um, fact yet because we're still talking about it. But there's a possibility that the camera could be um, uh, modified so that it accepts normal Ethernet instead of uh, fiber here, which would not require a grabber card. It also probably would not be any faster than USB 3, but it would uh, let you run long cables uh, via Ethernet, which are a little more reliable than USB 3. So that's still in the works. Um, if, if that seems like a good idea to anybody, let me know and I'll pass your comments along. Um, I'm going to say initially from an observatory standpoint is no, only because fiber optics doesn't, isn't subjected to interference over long distances. Yeah. That's well, my initial think, gut reaction. Yeah, I don't think Ethernet has much of a problem in that regard. But you're right, optical fiber clearly is the best choice. Oh, yeah. I mean, with most of the observatories that I've seen that do any type of serious type of connection, a lot of them use fiber uh, more than anything else because yeah. we're dealing with stupid amounts of data here. Yeah. All right. So um, the last call for questions. If there isn't any, we are going to uh, wrap this up. We've got about... Uh, Two minutes so if you guys got one more burning question coming out of nowhere um, feel free to fire it off and I think the obvious request is go back to that picture of the, uh, the <laughs> nebula. you know I was gonna say that I mean that for I mean this camera I mean this picture alone will sell that camera every day of the week i mean i'm not kidding you the, the just the just that sheer amount of detail in the background where you see all those wisps that a lot of people don't really pick up because they don't have the resolving capabilities but just to see that is just unreal i'd love to see what a single sub looks like i really would yeah so there's one thing you didn't mention about the QHY600, um, and I don't know if we can touch upon this, but have you seen what the dark frame looks like? Um, is there any amp glow? Is there any of this kind of issues? Uh, there is zero amp glow. No zero. amp glow. None. So you could literally get away with not taking calibration frames almost. Well, maybe the bias frames just to get rid of the hot pixels, but darks will almost be pointless. Yeah. Now, I said that pretty quick, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right. Um, Sony, uh, some of the chips uh, do have amp glow and uh, you know it's kind of an issue. To me, I, I wouldn't like it, but if you're taking short images, it's not much of a problem. If it calibrates out, it's not much of a problem. But to my recollection, the 600 does not have amp glow. 
Yeah, I, I, I think that you're right there as well. There, there was literally nothing. Right. Um, they, they fixed that issue a long, long time ago with, with that particular sensor. That yeah. sensor is also used on another camera, and I don't remember what it is off the top of my head, but it's, it wasn't even a problem for that, that camera either. Yeah, that, that should be the same for all the cameras that have this architecture, this 3.76 uh, micron pixel architecture. Mm -hmm. Number of chips like the 268 um, and others. Excellent. And the 410, uh, and the, I didn't mention the 410 and the 411. And the, I, 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 I think people are just going to be in complete shock and awe. And for anybody who's decided to just tune in and see this one picture, they're going to be going, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> so all I can say is you guys got a lot of work uh, ahead of you and something to aspire to because, uh, again, I have never seen anything like this at all. And here's the funny thing. I love monochrome images. I don't care for color um, a lot of the times. And when I see stuff like this, it, it, it just sets it just sets everything apart from everything else. And And this is the killer part, Mike, is... This happened in the last, what, three to four years in terms yep. of advancement? I mean, can you, if you remember what we had four, three, four years ago when it came down to these cameras, uh, and, and nobody has a result like this. And now by today's standard, to have something like this that is actually affordable, which is more important, to produce quality like this. I mean, I haven't even seen Hubble do something like this yet. This is remarkable. I mean, yeah. I, I've only been with QHY for a few years now. But when I first started, one of the with them, one of the one of the questions I always got from guys that were coming over from CCD world was, "Where's the big full frame monochrome chip? You know, where is it? Why? You know, that's what I want. They want to use their own filters. They want a monochrome sensor. And bang! I mean, within uh, within a year or so, Sony announces this uh, 600." Yeah, it just blows everybody out of the wall with this one. <laughs> yeah, I was surprised because I, I'm not sure where the commercial application for a 35 millimeter monochrome chip is. Where, I mean, with the old Kodak chips and on semi, you know, in mm -hmm. the old days, there were a lot of scientists, that, you know, buying those things. And uh, that's what people wanted. And that's why Kodak made them, not because us amateur astronomers were wanking in the backyard about not having a monochrome chip. We had a little sway, but not that much. Um, and Sony is even bigger and badder, and uh, for them to come out with the monochrome chip, clearly there's some application that I'm not aware of that is other than amateur astronomy, um, or maybe amateur astronomy is uh, is taken up uh, where uh, CCDs left off and is, is increasing. Yeah. All right, guys. Um, I, I can see Bob and everybody else itching to join into the uh, the chat now so we are over time anyway but i'm going to leave you with this um we do have the qhy 600 in stock ready to roll it out of the door if you want one uh now's your chance to get in and run away with one of them and we do have other qhy cameras so feel free to give us a call um uh the, the phone number is on our website uh, i don't remember what the 818 number is off the top of my head any longer so it's been a long day. Um, so yeah, just get to our website, telescopes.net. You can find our phone number on there. Annoy the crap out of Farah. Just call her and say you are watching the stream and see what you can strangle out of her because, hey, that's what she's there for. Michael, I really did enjoy this. I do appreciate you doing this. Um, I would love to have you come back for uh, the other products that you've got there, especially that, um, uh, that Starbox. I keep calling it, wanting to call it the Astro Bar, but the Astro Bar is an old thing now. The Star Master. Star Master, yeah. So that yeah, yeah, is. That's, uh, yeah, I, I, that's a, that, that could be very hot because a lot of people are, ask about it already. What do you mean could be hot? It's going, <laughs> it's going to be. It will be. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, uh, we, we have it as being, te it's being beta tested right now. Um, and then they've got to make some design decisions on the final, you know, uh, format, the size of it and should be out in the next uh, few months. So I need to talk to you is. about I need to talk to you about it so um, yep. we will do that another time. Again okay. Mike Mike thank you very much for doing this. Um, and we will see you guys hopefully in just a few moments with uh, Bob and Jeff uh, who will be doing the Optech/alpaca/ascom/everything demo 
uh, you've got to hang around for this thing because it is so worth it. So I will catch you guys after this video. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. My name is Jeff Dickerman. I'm with Optech Incorporated. Uh, we're based out of uh, Lowell, Michigan, which is outside of Grand Rapids um, in the Midwest. And uh, we are a manufacturing facility. We make, uh, primarily make actually uh, instruments for astronomy. Optech uh, started out as DOAA Enterprises. Uh, Jerry Persia was the founder. He was in college and was building drive correctors for, uh, um, you know, for uh, telescope mounts. He moved to Lowell in 1979 and founded uh, Optech Incorporated. Um, he, uh, Optech originally was a uh, uh, manufacturer of instrumentation. Uh, alongside that uh, drive corrector, we made a line of uh, single channel photometers, which we still make today. Jerry uh, kind of parlayed that into a line of instruments for the National Park Service called uh, visibility transmissometers and that worked into nephilometers and some other types of measurement instruments. And then in 1999, uh, he looked at the uh, focusers out there in the astronomy market, the amateur astronomy market, and realized that uh, there wasn't a good solid focuser on the market. So he designed the TCF, the temperature compensating focuser, that primarily is used to uh, correct the temperature drift of a typical Schmidt cast, at that time the Mead and the Celestrons. Um, that kind of developed into a number of other products. We've made filter wheels, we've made filter sliders. Um, we uh, uh, acquired uh, Alnatac Astro Systems some years ago, um, I guess in 2011 or so. Working with Jerry in 1988, I guess it was, I got out of the Marines. I was stationed out here in California. And I went back home and uh, started a family and um, decided to join uh, Optech as a kind of a sales and uh, manager. Uh, role and worked for him for many years and then in 19 or excuse me in 2008 my wife and I decided we're going to take the plunge we're going to become business owners and uh, so we bought the company from him and uh, been going strong ever since. Hi uh, I'm Jeff Dickerman from Optech Incorporated and today we're going to install a quick sync 40 uh, motor onto a feather touch 3545 focuser. We do everything in-house we do all our own machining. Uh, we have a uh, electronic board production facility. We make our own um, surface mount boards. We have a small shuttle oven that we hand load at this point, but uh, that'll be automated in the future as well. Uh, we have an optics lab, electronics lab, and um, do all the design work in-house. So we try to keep it close and local um, for our, our group in, uh, in Michigan. So this is the TCF Lynx. Uh, like all our other focusers, it's a temperature compensating focuser and has a temperature probe. The original TCF prototype from 1999 is still used every clear night in Grand Rapids. Um, we've had, a couple years ago, I had a customer uh, contact me and said he needed a new adapter for his TCF focuser. So uh, we sold him a new adapter and he said, you know, this is actually the third adapter I've had to buy because I've had three different telescopes. He goes, you know, I've, I've gone through a couple different cameras and two mounts and I think your TCF is the only thing I still have on my original rig. Um, so that's pretty typical for, uh, for the types of calls that we get from customers. The stuff that we build lasts and uh, we want it to last. Our basic approach with, uh, um, with all the instruments that we develop and uh, products that we design is that they should be remotely uh, controllable. So whether you're observing in your backyard or whether you're observing um, halfway around the world, um, the instrument, uh, the focuser, the rotator, the Alnatec flat panel, for instance, should be uh, available through a PC connection and uh, um, remotely controlled in a, in a robust and reliable way. Uh, the biggest uh, difficulty in automating an observatory is that things do break. So uh, we're pretty proud of the fact that most of our instruments uh, are pretty solid and um, don't, uh, don't fail. We uh, try to keep an eye out for um, what people need, and we listen to the customers quite a bit as well. Um, Gary Cole is one of our customers in Reno, Nevada, and he has given us so many product suggestions that have actually turned into successful products. Um, and um, there was a fellow named Ted Agos back east. He had a number of ideas, and so we've actually got a product name for him. He, uh, he said, well, you want to do it this way. So we did, and uh, made our own uh, changes and advances, of course, as well. But we have uh, good partnerships with, like, Starlight Instruments to make the feather touch focusers. Some folks have asked, well, why don't you make a 
manual folks here. Well, there's a great one out there already. We motorize it. We've helped, uh, we developed their uh, Focus Boss system. We call it our Focus Links. Um, we developed the clutch mo uh, motor mechanism. Um, so we work with them. Uh, we worked with Allnatac until uh, they decided they needed to sell the company. So we bought the company uh, outright uh, for the flat panels, for the flat fielders. Um, we work with uh, AG Optical, for instance. Um, we build a lot of his, we machine a lot of his uh, uh, com telescope components. And we work with Plane Wave and Celestron and Mead as well. One of the biggest challenges we have uh, in, in astronomy is that we have a big heavy moment arm out in space. And we're moving that moment arm all over the world. We're pointing in every direction of the sky. And so you have this big cantilevered weight, if you will. Um, so the robustness has to be built in from the beginning. So I work with the team to make sure that the load is going to move no more than a, an absolute minimum. Some of the other uh, things that we've done is, uh, uh, like with the Perseus, for instance, uh, the challenge there was to be able to get a spectrograph and a imaging camera and perhaps a planetary camera all on one telescope. And it has to be done remotely because we're Optech and we do everything such that it's remote. The challenge there was to look at uh, how do you move the image rather than moving the instruments because we initially thought about a large instrument turret and uh, dismissed that because of that moment arm load problem. It's hanging out in space, and now you're now you're adding one more dimension to your uh, uh, physical constraints on the mount and the telescope itself. So uh, a rotating mirror was the answer, and um, so the uh, the Perseus was born and has gone through a couple of generations. Actually, we're just introducing generation three now, which has internet capability. And um, Dan Van Nord, our uh, software engineer, was excited to show me that he could control it from his uh, tablet yesterday or the day before. So um, there's a uh, there, there's a desire in the in in, in our group, our uh, Optech design teams, to always stay on the cutting edge, and I feel like we've done that well, and we'll continue to do that in the future. The new uh, TCF Leo is our thin thin focuser. It's about an inch and a quarter thick, so about the thickness of your eyepiece, and. Uh, um, Rather than use belts, which is the way we normally will run a, uh, you know, a thin focuser like that so you can run some lead screws, uh, we did it all in gears. So it's fully geared. You pull the cover off, it looks like a steampunk engine. And we actually have an acrylic uh, uh, back home we're cutting right now. We're going to try and see if we can get that so we can show it for our, just, for, just for the visibility of it. But it also has full uh, 21st century technology. It's, it's got the Focus Links controller that has full Wi-Fi capability. Uh, Ethernet and serial, USB serial right out of the box. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, we, we, try to, uh, we try to come up with innovative designs for all the products that we make. And in fact, uh, my chief engineer, Lee uh, Dickerman, um, says that if he can't do it innovatively, if he can't do something new, he doesn't want to do what everybody else does. So it's got to be something new and unique. And there's got to be a new, new and unique way to go about it. And, and it's robust too. Uh, you can't show that in the video, but uh, you've hefted some of these things. Everything is heavy, so not excessively heavy, but heavy for a purpose. I think that lends itself to some of the old style, old look designs, um, but uh, uh, like with the, uh, with the hand control that you just mentioned, you know, we've just added the uh, encoder, the rotary encoder to it. So now you've got a thumb wheel that you can rotate and just tap it for different uh, speeds for your focuser, and that works retroactively with all the old uh, um, Focus Boss and TCF Links and all of our all of our devices. CBS Television presents a special report on Sputnik One, the Soviet space satellite. Douglas Edwards reporting. No, I was interested in astronomy as a little shaver. I uh, I wanted to be an astronomer when I grew up, and um, you know the space race was big. One of my earliest memories, of course, is my dad getting me up to watch the Apollo Eleven. Um, astronauts. Uh, a lot of the young folks today don't have that. They haven't been alive when someone walked on the moon. Though I think uh, there are other interests that there, there are other, I don't know what's the right word, it's star, like Star Wars for instance, still uh, fires up that imagination. But uh, you know, we were living through it. The space race was real and uh, um, it, was a, it was a different time for us. 
and I don't think we have as many distractions. Today there's so many distractions that uh, uh, it's, it's, it's hard for uh, people to focus the way that I think some of the uh, early baby boomers did. Well, space is there, and we're going to climb it. And the moon and the planets are there, and new hopes for knowledge and peace are there. And therefore, as we set sail, we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. Thank you. Perhaps it's a natural evolution uh, into the private sector. Uh, I don't know if that's good or bad, but that's, I think that's a natural evolution that, um, uh, that the private sector will uh, ultimately take over space travel, um, space exploration. But I think that uh, the big difference was everybody in the 60s was involved and interested in the space race. The man on the street who may not have an interest in astronomy or space himself knew about it and he was vested. Um, today we're leaving it to the Jeff Bezos and Elon Musks to stir our imagination. We need to stir it ourselves. It needs to come from the STEM systems, the school systems, the, um, the education industry needs to do a better job, and I think they are. It's not fair for me to say they need, need to do a better job, but I think that they need to really stir the imagination of the children, uh, the young people today, to go out and do something, not to sit back and watch someone else. Hands on, that's what we need, more hands on. first memory I had, I had a Mead 6-inch that I bought. I was probably 15, 16 years old, a Newtonian, F8 Newtonian, and uh, trying to find the Ring Nebula. And I was out near Flint, Michigan, out in the middle of nowhere. No astronomy, friends, no, I was out, I was out in the wilderness, and uh, I searched for that thing for two weeks. <laughs> and I know I must have looked at it many times before I realized, oh, that's what it is. So, Dabbled in a little bit of uh, astrophotography back in the film days, but when the CCDs came online, that's when uh, it really started, to, the interest really started to pop.
guys, we are back, hopefully. Um, now, this is going to be something else that you've probably never seen before because there is just a bunch of us in a big row here. I am at the top, and below me, I have Bob Denny. Uh, you might remember him from such shows as the one that happened previously. A new face, Daniel Van Nord. Welcome. And, of course, my good old friend, Jeff Dickerman from Optech. So... Hello. Give you guys, uh, give yourselves a brief introduction. Let's start with you, Jeff. Oh, um, I'm Jeff Dickerman from Optech Incorporated. Uh, we make focusers, camera rotators, uh, field flat uh, flatteners, um, a number of different products for aftermarket for your uh, telescopes and uh, remote observing. Daniel, give us a quick intro about yourself. So hi, I'm Daniel. I am a software developer at Optech and a member of the ASCOM team working to develop Alpaca technology. And last but not least, Bob. I'm Bob Denny. Um, I'm the chief bottle washer for DC3 Dreams, but also um, a, a flag waiver for uh, Al ASCOM and Alpaca. And um, I've been asked to give a quick introduction of what is alpaca. Uh, the, the image that you're seeing right now on the screen is where things were years ago when almost all software was on Windows, but everything was just a mass of un incompatible connections between equipment and uh, software. And ASCOM made a universal set of interfaces to go between software and devices. What alpaca is, is it's a re-engineering of that or recasting of it, the same basic technology, but over network connections instead of on Windows through the operating system. So now you can have universal interfaces that operate across different platforms and different pieces. So what you're going to see today is a uh, standalone focusing system that is not part of any Windows system or anything else, but being able to be interfaced from various other devices. It's basically a universal interface between everything. And I think this is the way things are going to go. And I think Simon would agree with me that oh, this totally. is going to be the future for sure. I mean, so, so just so you guys understand uh, who are watching this at home and for the live audience that are watching this, this is actually happening for real. This is not a pre-recorded video that we've come up with. And these guys are really here. Um, we can make them say the time of day, but I'm not going to go down that road. This is not that type of video. But more importantly is this is actually, as far as I can tell, the world premiere of Alpaca actually working. Right. Um, you can actually buy this product right now and have it work out the door. And so, the ASCOM platform itself, I need to stick this in there. Yep. The current just released ASCOM platform 6.5 has all of this technology in it. It allows something that is operating out on the Alpaca network connections to talk to devices inside on Windows with no changes to that Windows software. That's really important. Right, it that's exactly provides it. provides cross-compatibility today. It's out there. So and what you're going to see is production. Okay, so uh, we're going to give it over to uh, Jeff and Daniel. I will be monitoring the chat. If you guys have any questions, um, feel free to start pinging them off. We can probably interrupt depending on where we are at this particular presentation. And then Bob will be the person who is going to be the backwards and forwards. So you'll probably see less of me in this one because this is so new that even I don't know it and I don't want to dare say anything because I don't know nothing and I want to know something. So take it away, boys. I want to hear this. Daniel, go ahead. All right. So for our first little demonstration here, I have got one of our Uptech uh, Third Links X-Series focusers on my desk. And I've got it attached to a Raspberry Pi. And I would like to now run it from my Windows computer, even though it's attached to my Raspberry Pi. It's not attached to this Raspberry Pi, but you get the idea. It's kind of on the other side and hard to get to. So I'm going to share my screen now. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to remote desktop 
using VNC into the Raspberry Pi. I'll make that nice and full screen. So there we are. This is just a stock Raspberry Pi. And I basically just set it up the other day. There's nothing special installed. And so I'm actually going to run the Focus Links Alpaca system on this Raspberry Pi just by double clicking this file, which you can download, and say execute. So now we've gotten to on the Pi in the web browser, the Focus Links Alpaca system. So from here, I can just connect to those third links, and this is all on the Raspberry Pi. This is attached just to USB cable to the Raspberry Pi. I can now connect. I can change any of the settings, although these are all correct. I can go in. I can move it. Let's see if I stop sharing my screen, actually. Can you bring the center camera up, Simon? The one that's got both of us? Um, oh, it's uh, be full screen? Yep. Uh, we can do that. OK. So if you look in the middle of the table, you should be able to see. Point to it, Jeff. Oh, he, is right. he, he missed it. You should be able to see the focuser going up. And now going back down. And that's being controlled for, from, from the Raspberry, from the Raspberry Pi, Pi directly. Yeah, you can right. see I'm running on the Raspberry Pi directly. Yep. Right. So now I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. So now I'd like to run this from my Windows computer. So you can see I've got the remote desktop and the Raspberry Pi. I'm just going to close that. Uh, close that. And I'm going to start up the SkyX on my Windows desktop. So I would like to connect to this focuser through the ASCOM system, that compatibility layer that Bob mentioned that's built into the platform. So I'm just going to so, go in. Go ahead, Bob. Also built into the Sky. The Sky has ASCOM compatibility, but this this version of the Sky has absolutely no changes to it. It's just exactly as shipped by Software Bisk with no added plugins or anything else to allow what you're about to see to happen. Yep, yeah, it's completely normal stock. SkyX, and there is no native Alpaca support. So I'm going to go through their built-in ASCOM support. You can see here, I've just opened up your normal ASCOM chooser. But in the new version of the platform, you now have an Alpaca option. And I am going to enable discovery. And what this does is this tells the ASCOM platform to go out and look for any Alpaca devices that are currently available. So you can see I now have a nice little green light. And I can go in. And you'll see there actually are two new Alpaca devices, because I actually have two attached to my Raspberry Pi. I would like to use the first one. So I've selected that one, and I'll just say OK. And now it's going to ask me if I want to create the driver. So now I have created an actual ASCOM Alpaca compatibility driver to allow remote access. And if I say control this ASCOM device, you'll see on my Windows computer, I just popped right up to pretty much that same control window we saw in the Raspberry Pi. And I'll actually turn my remote desktop back on so I can go back and forth between these. I'll type my password in correctly, and then I will go back to the NC. So you can see pretty much the same screen. If I move this one from the Raspberry Pi, you can see it pretty much reporting in real time on the Windows side. But now let's go back to the Sky X. So I am going to just say, OK. 
and I am going to connect. So you can see, if I don't know if it's hard, it might be hard to see, but we're at position uh, 200 and we're getting a temperature read. If I pull that browser right back open and bring this off to the side, you'll actually be able to see as I move it from the web browser, it's moving in the sky X. If I start it moving on the Raspberry Pi, you can see it removing and reporting the position in real time in the sky X. If I halt it here, it halts there. If I move it from the sky X, we can see it moving in real time. Remember, this focuser is connected directly to the Raspberry Pi. There is no direct connection to my desktop that's running all of the other software. It's being connected through the Alpaca system. I'm going to make a point here. You can't do this any other way. If you have a standard Windows PC running ASCOM with a focuser, you can only have that, what, that machine that you've got connected can be the only thing that controls it. This is three different programs, essentially, controlling one device. On two different operating systems and two completely separate computers at the same time. Yeah. And the web-based configuration screens you see are running in a standard browser, and that's part of the Alpaca system of mm -hmm. their focus links. And they wrote that software. Daniel wrote the web forms and everything that you see there. And the magic part of this is as he makes a change on one, it actually reflects back into the actual focuser and into the same web interface on Windows and into the sky. So they're all cooperating together through those universal interfaces. And if I wanted to control this focuser from my cell phone, as long as I'm on the same network, I can control it from my cell phone. You can write native applications for whatever platform you want. And as long as they're capable of doing just basic TCP IP communication on that platform, you're able to write and control an Alpaca device like it's attached to that device. So all of a sudden I can have a native app on my Android phone or on an iPhone that's controlling an Alpaca device it could be just a standalone device with Alpaca built into it or running off of a Windows computer or a Mac or a Raspberry Pi, it doesn't matter. Now, um, I know some people are going to be asking about this right off the bat is the security side of things. Um, the danger is this coming over the internet. So you, got, you mentioned uh, to me yesterday that there is a security protocol implementation for this particular thing. Yeah, there's a couple different pieces of security. Um, the first piece of security is that by default and by design, the discovery protocol that let my Windows computer find the focuser won't work over the open internet. Even if you tried to port forward it, those packets would be dropped upstream on the system. So you can't discover devices that were there. The second piece of security is we recommend if you want to control it on a different network, you actually VPN into the network you want to run on rather than trying to port forward the Alpaca device on that network. So by VPNing in, you've got the security of your VPN software to protect it and your devices aren't publicly accessible outside. Um, the third option is it does if you look in the uh, ASCOM tools, it does actually support um, basic authentication if the device or the driver supports the basic authentication. So there's kind of multiple layers, but the first and really critical one is you can't discover devices outside of the subnet that the device is running on. And I, I would add that the design of this is not meant to run over the public internet. It's meant to run in a sterile environment, and ideally, you'd air gap it. You wouldn't even have a way to get into the low-level stuff unless you're running remote things that come in through a firewall or something. But the idea is an observatory installation should really be running on, a, on an isolated internet and not across the public internet. That would be kind of crazy. And it's not designed to do that, and it wouldn't be recommended anyway. So um, just for you guys watching at home, uh, if you were watching at the beginning, 
Bob showed a picture of a mass of wiring and that that picture has a lot of meaning so daniel can you hold up the uh, the focus links box now and show people how suddenly that mass of wiring has now been drastically reduced so for the next demo i'll actually be using this hub right here so you can see on this one there's only a power and an ethernet cable running to it now this is a, this is special this device has built in ethernet support it does, not, um, it does not require any sort of USB connection. The computer can be hooked directly into your network. So this is running directly into the same network that my desktop is. So now I'm going to disconnect from my um, Raspberry Pi on both these sides. And I'm actually going to shut Alpaca down on the Raspberry Pi. So now, if I go right back into the SkyX, and once again, I run Alpaca Discovery, you'll actually see there's a new device, a Focus Links F1. This is actually the Alpaca service running directly inside of the Focus Links controller hub, just our standard Ethernet equipped Focus Links. So when I say OK, once again, I'll create a dynamic driver. And this time, if I pop up the web config, we'll actually see a much simpler web page because this is running inside of an embedded controller. But once again, I can go and I can make any changes that I want here. And I'm just gonna say, okay. So this is, there's no drivers at all in this. The only thing being used is just the native ASCOM platform and the Focus Links Hub, which I'm going to stop sharing my screen real quick so I can hold that up and show you. That better. So just this Focus Links hub, just one Ethernet cable and one power cable. And now when I resume sharing, I can connect. And we'll see if we look at the web browser that both the device's native control built into the device and the SkyX are reporting the exact same position. I can move it from either one. I grab my browser back, we'll see it moving in real time. And like I said, this is entirely running inside of the control box. SkyX has no extra plugins. It's just using the native ASCOM platform on Windows to talk to it. And it's all being run through the Alpaca system. I'm going to reiterate this. This is not a dummy thing or a dummy version or an ASCOM simulator. This is really an actual fully functional box that you can actually buy today. Just keep that in mind, that this is actually happening. This is actually going to happen for a lot of other products. And more importantly, the for you guys, if you are liking what you're seeing so far, you need to get out there and you need to say to all the different vendors who are not ASCOM ready yet, or let alone uh, Alpaca ready, and say, we need to make this happen. At the end of the day, there's only so much uh, myself, Daniel, Jeff, and Bob can do within the industry, but it's you guys who are the end users that matter for us. So if, if you have your favorite company that you buy a lot of their products from and you like their devices, you need to just go up to them and say, hey, I love all this stuff, but you guys really need to start doing Alpaca because it opens the door up to so much more opportunities and you know, there are other people out there who are trying to do these outreach programs, especially with remote observatories, and this ultimately solves such a big problem to have all these crazy devices. And I've seen some of these guys' the setups with their observatories, and I sit there and go, what on earth is all of these cables <laughs> hanging off? You know, and I'll be like trying to tiptoe around. I'm like, dude, you don't need to do this any longer. If you start looking into Alpaca, if you start believing in it, the system will happen. Yeah. And then let's say right now that I wanted to run this Focus Links hub, which is attached over Ethernet from my Raspberry Pi. There's no direct wire connection to the Raspberry Pi. It's just, just the Alpaca system. I can go to the web browser 
And in this case, I'm actually going to And now I am running my focus links controller hub from a Raspberry Pi, while at the same time, I am running it from the Sky X on Windows. Again, this is just the hub. There's no extra devices or servers or anything like that serving it out. This is just the single physical hub box. So this is a standalone piece of hardware that only needs a network connection. In, in Daniel's case, it's Ethernet, but it could just as easily be Wi-Fi from the focuser box. And all that focuser box has is a little embedded controller and a Wi-Fi in it, or an embedded controller and an Ethernet. Nothing else. And he's talking to it from a browser on a Pi and from an unmodified copy of the Sky running on Windows which is pretty cool. Yep. And there are no drivers. If the device supports Alpaca, you don't need to install an ASCOM driver. All you need to do is go into that chooser, enable discovery, and you can just select the Alpaca device and the platform takes care of the rest. I just got a question here uh, online. Um, is Alpaca REST as an REST based? So is it easy to script? It is REST-based, yes. And then how easy is it to actually do the scripting? It is extremely easy. In fact, if you look at the REST APIs that Alpaca requires, which are all available on the ASCOM website, you'll notice that all of the commands actually match the traditional ASCOM commands word for word, which means if you're used to the concept of you know, telling a focuser to move to a specific position, just like you would in ASCOM, the equivalent alpaca command is move and then to that specific, specific position. One of the interesting things about uh, this particular screen that Dan's got up is that that web page is being generated within our device, our focus links device. But we also have our third links devices, which are USB. So they're not Ethernet, but can you show them how we can talk to a third links? Yeah, let me show them right now. So back on my Raspberry Pi, I will just fire up once again that same Focus Links Alpaca um, system. And the Focus Links Alpaca works with every one of our current Focus Links products. So Focus Links, Third Links, and LSIs. And I can just go in and connect. And now I am running a direct sync ESX30 from a Raspberry Pi through the web browser. And if I go back to the Sky X, I can disconnect from this one. I can choose the ASCOM focuser. And in the chooser, I can just find a focus links focuser and just say OK. And then I should just be able to say connect. And you'll notice that once again, I am connected to that same third links ESX, which is a USB only focuser, but it's using the focus links Alpaca server on the Raspberry Pi to offer it up as an Alpaca device. So even though, even though the device is not an ethernet device, you can still use Alpaca to pass all the packets across the, uh, the network. Um, so, Bob, this is probably going to be an obvious question here that I'm going to end up asking. We're just seeing focuses right now. Um, what is the true tip of the iceberg in all of this? I mean, I, I know people are going to say, how does Alpaca work for a camera? How does Alpaca work on a, uh, a filter wheel and so forth and so on? Well, I can speak to that. There are interfaces in ASCOM, both in the Alpaca and in the Windows flavors of that, that, that address all of the astronomy devices. So the specifications are out there. The support on the Windows side in the platform is out there. So the missing piece of the puzzle is the chicken and egg problem, right? So we've got the chickens sitting out there. Now we need some eggs or vice versa. And that is for someone to build a camera or a mount 
or a filter wheel or a dome controller that speaks alpaca like Optex focusers speak alpaca and the, all the software on Windows can talk to them and anyone else who wants to script rest and talk to them would be able to talk to them as well. But it takes those, it's like what you said, Simon, at the beginning, talk to your suppliers and tell them they need to do this because that's where it's got to come from next. All the pieces are there except the actual devices of each of these kinds that could, it, they could be designed and built today. Of course, it takes longer than one day to do that. But the support for it is all there right now. And the ASCOM team, including myself, are working on template drivers that will enable people to build Alpaca services for their devices very quickly. So Jeff, um, I believe you have another demonstration with a scope and a camera plugged into it. Yes, um, um, I will stop sharing. Yep. Okay. I'm going to kill my webcam because it doesn't seem to like my webcam much. So let me see. I'll kill the video. All right. See if I can get this. This cap to come open. Again, for you guys at home watching this, uh, you got questions, do not hesitate to ask. Um, if you guys are not quite following on or don't know what's happening, please let me know. This is the point of this particular presentation. We're here to clarify all of your questions in regards to Alpaca because needless to say, it's great watching a slideshow, it's great listening, but when you're actually seeing it actually working, it means something. I know for some of you probably thinking, well, it's just a focus moving backwards and forwards. It's nothing exciting. The reality behind it here is just what Daniel was showing. We actually had multiple platforms controlling the actual system. So you could actually see the focuses like going up and down uh, and moving about. So these guys are literally just switching over so Jeff can um, get over to his thing, hopefully. Well, while we, while we wait for Jeff, why don't I do another quick demo? Oh yeah, sure. I might, sorry, I might have jumped ahead of you then. One mistake. That's fine. So I'm just gonna quick show you guys, you know, this, you know, it looks pretty cool. It was pretty smooth to see all the connections. So, it's got to be hard to set up, right? Well, not really. So I'm actually going to boot up a clean virtual machine. I haven't installed pretty much anything but a web browser and a single tool. And I am going to attach an Optech third links. If Windows ever boots up. <laughs> Yeah, well, we'll give it a minute and it should boot. Yes, it's, this is the very exciting moment where we get to watch the Windows flag go majestically in little circles. I think I have seen every iteration of that Windows flag that could ever exist. <laughs> So yeah, you can see I've only really installed just a few little programs. And what I'm going to do now is I just downloaded the Focus Links Alpaca driver for Windows. And now the reason we need this driver is because the third links doesn't have Ethernet built in. It's just a USB device. And I'm just going to install it. Um, just to point out, we don't have to worry about COM ports any longer, do we? We don't have to mess around checking board rates, parity, bits, and all that stuff. Um, oh, Firefox wants to do an update. Um, of course it does. <laughs> so the answer is a little bit there is, the answer is both yes and no, because it's a little complicated. So for devices that support Alpaca natively, no, there's no messing around. If the device requires a proxy driver to support Alpaca, the driver should take care of all of that. Like this one automatically found our third links plugged in via USB. And that's it. I am now running a third links attached to this Windows virtual machine. And if I just minimize this and I go back to the Sky X,
Okay, so just so you guys understand who are not familiar with um, virtualization, it is like being on two completely different PCs for all intent and purposes. Not specifically a PC, but any two physical platforms. Okay, so just remember that. It's two physical machines right now. That's what yeah. VMware does. I could see I just found a new Alpaca device, which has the IP address of my virtual machine because it's running in its own little separate space with its own separate IP. And now I can literally just say, okay, create another driver. And now if I pop up this device, I am now controlling the focuser that was attached to my virtual machine on my real physical machine. Which, and this would just be the same as me having a completely separate computer on the other side of the room. This was just a lot easier to set up in terms of space. I didn't have to bring in more than just a couple computers. And then if I go into the Sky X, I can once again just connect. And now I am controlling a third Lynx, which is a USB only focuser over Alpaca without installing any drivers at all on the machine with the Sky X. Everything just flows and works. That's the, that should be for pretty much every setup, the entire setup process, at least for an Optech Focus Links product for Alpaca. It's literally just as simple as installing the driver, making sure any connection settings that had to be set were set, and then just saying connect. Um, um, I know Jeff is uh, tinkering around on his machine still, but I think he can still hear me. Yeah, um, we're set. So your, let me understand this. All of your devices are going to be Alpaca. Is that correct? Yes. So remember that, folks. Optech has, you know, Optech is probably the first company out there right now that is driving Alpaca forward like there's no tomorrow. In fact, Jeff looks like he's sitting on an Alpaca flying away right now. <laughs> but that's, you know, that's the whole thing. It's they decided to take the Alpaca by the head and run with this particular thing because you know he feels uh, really strongly about it. Bob obviously feels uh, incredibly strongly about Alpaca, and in all honesty, when I first heard of Alpaca, I, I my my first initial reaction was, okay, great, when's it out? And I think I remember saying this to you, Bob, when we met at AIC, when's Alpaca coming out? And you couldn't give me an answer because you, the problem was is it was getting people on board. It's a chicken and egg problem. Yeah. But you see, here's a great thing, though, for you, Bob, as far as I'm concerned. You've got a chicken and an egg right now. The chicken yep. being Optic or <coughs> a, a, an alpaca. Vice versa. <laughs> Whichever. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you were you were the guy that bought the egg to them. And this is it. We are rolling. Whether you like it or not, for the people out there, alpaca is here. This is but I have something to say right now while Jeff's getting ready that is really important. There are a number of people involved in this. I'm just, like I said, a flag waver. Dan, you saw the discovery protocol. Daniel is the architect of that discovery protocol. And trust me, it went through a lot of revision and a lot of refinement. And it's a work of art. It's really nice, and especially how it's been implemented. And it works like a charm. So you, he, he has been a major contributor to Alpaca in a, a number of ways. But as you were saying, Jeff had the vision and not only did he have the vision, he put his money where his mouth was. And I've thanked him for this a number of times. Thank you for allowing to Daniel to sink his teeth into this thing. And the results are just spectacular. So really between Daniel and, and uh, Jeff and Daniel, they really took it forward from the concept phase to the yeah, implementation see. phase, but there's one more person that really needs to be mentioned. And his name is Peter Simpson in the UK. He's responsible for the um, ASCOM platform and all of the Alpaca uh, infrastructure, the middleware, all of that. And it's, it is huge. I mean, he's basically ahead of everybody with the platform 6.5, which is just being rolled out now. Peter has done an enormous amount of work and he's really doesn't get the recognition he deserves and he really should get a huge amount of appreciation on all of this because he really got the, got the whole thing too. Definitely agree. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wonder if he's still awake. 
<laughs> well, it's only 10. We should have had him on Zoom. I know, it's only 10.15 over there. I mean, he should still be awake. He's an astronomer, yeah, for God's we sake. Should, we should uh, get him on the next one of these, for sure. Well, hey, I'm ready to share. Okay, so go I'm for it. Okay, screen. great. Okay. Let's see this. So this is a uh, uh, third links focuser on a little uh, 60 millimeter scope with a Skyris camera. It's kind of dirty, sorry. Um, I am going to... <laughs> this is one of our beat up ones. We work pretty hard. We work these things pretty hard. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell Daniel, okay, I've got my own laptop right here that you guys are all looking at. I've got that uh, focuser connected and camera connected to this machine. So what do you want me to do to allow you to get into it? All you need to do is just start up Alpaca. Okay, let's go into the desktop. That guy right there, right? Yep, the Focus Links Alpaca system. Now that's gonna bring up a window for my local host, uh, that web page that is developed from Alpaca. And then I'll get back in here. And I'm gonna connect from my desktop and I am going to focus Jeff's system from my computer. You can see Jeff, you can see Jeff's screen. He's Jeff's not doing anything. No. Nope. Yeah, put your hands up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> and and like, as we mentioned, this is a third link. It has a direct USB connection to the computer. And yet I am able to get us a very nice look at the flag, which is actually very small and all the way across the street. You know, one of the things that I just thought about is troubleshooting has just completely just changed. In fact, you've kind of made it easier mm -hmm. to figure out if there's a problem with something. I mean, I, I can almost imagine I, I'm going to get a phone call saying, hey, can you check out what the hell's going on with the focuser? I don't know if it's in focus or what. Can you just quickly nudge it real quick? And it's like, yeah, no problem. Boom, straight in VN, uh, VPN open up the system and go, ooh, click well, on that. We, we do a lot of uh, TeamViewer tech support and TeamViewer will get you in. It kind of works like a VPN, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, it's through a browser, of course. But um, So you'd be able to jump in to their network and walk them through whatever needs to be done. And I expect over the next year, we'll probably spend a lot of time with our customers helping them configure Alpaca. It's what mm -hmm. we do. Yep. And then there's the other option as well, where if you've got some special focusing software just on the one computer, now all of a sudden you can use Alpaca, have a completely different computer. In this case, it could be a Raspberry Pi up on your mount, yep. and then actually run all of your focus and all of your stuff from whatever computer you want. So it opens up a lot of flexibility in how and where you control your different pieces of hardware. So let me understand this then. You're, what you're saying here then is I can truly have literally two wires coming off of my system, like my telescope, uh, the power obviously for the mount and, uh, and all the peripherals, and just an ethernet cable. I, I don't have to have a USB with a limited range on top of that. I mean, USB's uh, a length is limited to, uh, I forgot what it was now, 50, 60 feet or something like that. But with ethernet, I mean, we can go on for ages. Yeah, all you need is a power source and a network connection. So, I mean, that, just so you guys get this, it means that we don't have to have some crazy USB hub figure out how to run a long USB cable back to wherever it is that we're hiding with repeaters and you know all sorts of crazy stuff. It is literally just ethernet runs to your house and then however you want to power your mount. I mean. You know, the funniest thing is I can see myself sitting in my car with my phone, uh, just accessing everything and, and then just controlling it in that uh, fashion. I mean, yes, I know that there are products out there that exist that already have that capability, but there is just nothing out there that has this level of ease. So I could be yes. on my laptop. I can be on my phone. I can be logged in in multiple places for all I care and I can control it. The alpaca device or the alpaca system will allow you to use any of your devices. 
a lot of the solutions out there are kind of closed solutions. You mm -hmm. have to buy, you know, that manufacturer's focuser, filter wheels, all the way along in order to control it remotely like this. But with Alpaca, once the manufacturers all adopt this, you'll be able to use all their equipment on one little Raspberry Pi or one little Nook or whatever little computing device you want to put up there, an Intel stick. Yeah, and you know, all of the Alpaca APIs are open. They're all published, they're all documented. It's all available. You know, the discovery protocol is open source. All of it's documented. There's examples in a bunch of different languages. This isn't a closed, you know, one-off. Our specific phone app works with our specific desktop app. This is anybody can implement an Alpaca client to control Alpaca devices, and anyone can implement an Alpaca device to control any hardware. The thing is, the, the stuff that's going over the network, whether it's Wi-Fi or Ethernet, is universal. That's not like the, the bits and bytes that would go from a focuser over USB to the to a PC. And then inside the PC, there's more software that, in, it, that interprets the hash mark 671 pound sign something and turns that into something else and so forth. So for troubleshooting, you get rid of blocks. You're able to, to figure out which where the problem is. If you have a program that can talk to any focuser, and the problem is with all the focusers, well, then it's a problem in the program. But if you have a problem that talks to any focuser and one focuser is giving you a problem, now the problem's in the focuser. So from troubleshooting, that's the other piece of the puzzle is that with a universal interface like that, you're able to divide and conquer to solve problems. Um, real quick, Jeff, I noticed on your screen when you were sharing it um, that you had more than one focus uh, 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 focus links hub showing up yes yeah our focus links hubs can have multi instances so if you've got you know two focusers on our dual focus controller well you could add two more with a second hub you could add a single with the third links because it, uh, our software talks to all those uh, types of devices so now here's a little fun uh, thought for you uh, you have the Sagittus. Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly, the motor on that is very similar to the um, the X series motors. Theoretically, that can be ported over in 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 literally what weeks? Well, not quite. We have to. Uh, uh, we have a lot more going on on the um, on these quick sync motors. I don't know if you can see it, but. Uh, the QuickSync third links has got a dual board stack in there, and they won't fit in the Sagita body unless we oh, redesign. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but in the case of the Sagita, the Sagita is run directly off of one of our um, Focus yeah. Links controller. Yeah, the Focus Links controller. That's right. These these have the option of having built-in Alpaca, or they work with the Focus Links Alpaca system. So the Sagita already yeah. works with the existing Alpaca system. So. All I have to do is for those, and, and this is the killer part, for those people who already own Optech devices, you are already halfway there, essentially. Yes. So do I have to replace that box now, uh, the focus links? No. Just add a uh, second board, you know, if you need. If you've Stop. got one board, we have a lot of them out there that are being used in a single mode. So if you want to add the off-axis guider that's motorized, you can just add a little board with it. So it, what about the Alpaca side of things? Do they have to make any modifications, or is it just software they're downloading? Just software or mm -hmm. in an upcoming beta firmware that'll support it directly inside of the hub. So that's a challenge for you guys at home who own any of the uh, focus links, third links, um, whatever other links devices, because there's too many of them now. <laughs> Even I get confused. Um, I actually invite you to install it, try it, play around with it, because there's nothing. It's, it's great for us to show the demo, but when you get to do it, that's a thing. And if you already own them or own this, you can already do this. I, I think, I don't know how much else I can make myself clear <laughs> on, on, on that, the fact that this is actually here. 
Yeah, I think we're we're pretty much ready. Um, we, the platform is out. Is it is still at release candidate or is it ready? I'm not sure, Bob. Do you know if 6.5 has gone live or is it still standby? Um, I'm waiting for Peter. It's a day. It's days away, not weeks or months. And um, uh, we're we all have what I'm. He he has said what's out there now. You know, the, the last one that he posted a day or two ago is it. But I'm waiting for him to tell me to make the changes on the website to say that okay, this is it. So um, it's it's probably this weekend will be listed on the website. But if anybody wants that 6.5, um, you can hop on the ASCOM uh, list and you can get to the ASCOM website, which I should show people if you don't mind, Simon, should oh, I, yeah, let's may I share. share my screen for just a moment? Okay. Um, this is the uh, screen one. I wanted to just do a window. Hmm. Well, this will have to do. Can I do an advanced? No. Okay, basic. I thought I could share a specific window and not the entire screen. Oh, I think you can. Not doing it. Huh. Well, all right. It's not giving me that choice right now, so I'll just share the whole dang thing. You can see this. Uh, let me get my audio mixer out of the way here. Okay, so this is the ASCOM website. It's just ascom-standards.org. Once you get in there, you'll see an alpaca logo. If you're a developer, developers take note. We'll take you to here, and there's all the information on alpaca, some videos, and so forth. And then once it goes live, this platform downloading button over here um, we'll have 6.5 on it and you'll be able to get that. So um, I just wanted to make sure that you saw that. And then uh, there's a community link here and there's an in here. There are several forums. The main one for just users and not uh, driver developers is this one, the ASCOM talk forum. So I kind of went fast on that. Let me go back to the, if you go home, community here, if you can see it here, ASCOM Talk Users Forum, or over here, boom. And then uh, you can join this forum, and there's lots of good info here and spirited discussions and so forth, uh, and to be able to uh, participate in the discussion. So I just wanted to show you that. Yeah, I'll stop awesome. sharing now. That's great. And then also on that ASCOM website, you can get to all of the API documentation on the Alpaca APIs. They're all right up on there. I can point people to that if you would like. Yeah, that's, that's, great, that's, that's show people because they're okay, going to really want to see that. Let's do that. Um, back to share my screen. I don't know why I can't share just the thing here. So, all right. Is that it? Can you see that now? Uh, no, not quite yeah, yet. Yeah, yeah, One, two, three, three, go. There we go. There we go. All right. So in the developers section, now you can see, uh, I have to remember where the link to the online version of the uh, standards are. Do you remember? Ah, here we go. Cross-platform introduction, Alpaca API. Here we go. And it's actually a live API that you can go through and... Um, look at the interfaces to each of the types of devices, and then you can actually put in information and try it out. So it has, it's um, not just a static document, it's actually uh, a swagger definition thing uh, that defines the API and how it's supposed to be cast and rest and all that sort of thing. So I don't, let me go backwards again here and two, three, One more time. Oh, that was a, okay. So you go here to home and then developers take note right there, or you can go to developers here, either way that gets you here. 
and here's all the developer information for ASCOM and ASCOM Alpaca. One of the two, there's the live API. There's an introduction to Alpaca here. This is the API I just showed you. And then there's a reference to it also that's in PDF that gives all of the, the information about how to construct packets and, and make them behave so that they uh, will participate. So as you can see, it's very um, documented in great detail here. So the, for, for developers, it's all there. There's nothing that's, you know, in the future. Okay, so hopefully you guys now have a better understanding of Alpaca. I know we covered the theory behind it on Bob's talk from the previous show. Now we've actually seen a fully running version of it. Um, and believe you me, I know we don't look like we're excited because we're astronomers at the end of the day. How can you tell if we're excited? Because you only see us in the dark. But we're actually excited. <laughs> I've seen us being kids yesterday during the testing phase, and I, I had so many questions, and my mind was just bobbling away. But so onwards for the next part of uh, the show is Jeff. I believe you've got a table stacked to the brim full of goodies. In fact, I can kind of see it here. Yeah. It, uh, um, this is how we do things. We always let's lay it out because we're in between the camera and the telescope. Now, right. At AIC, so see. You know, we did the uh, uh, scope demos with uh, with Woodland, and that that worked out very well for us. We'll probably do that again in future shows, but for today, we're on the table. Um, you, I'm going to uh, drop my and, my audio and video because uh, that's this is now your guys' time to shine. So, Bob, oh, I just want thank to say you very much. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Bob. You're most welcome, and I'll, I'll stick around, but um, I uh, don't need to take up screen space, so I don't know if you want to. Okay. Um, do you want to grab the little phone? Yep. And we'll just kind of show, run through what we've got. Yep. So I'll just All right, so I'm going to send you. Dan around the other side, and we should both be still connected. You guys hear me? Yep, we can still hear you. Okay, so his speaker's still on, and I can hear you through these things. You just grab the phone right off of there. You might want to tug the microphone just a wee bit closer or stand where the microphone is, Jeff. Which one do you want to show first? Let's, uh, let's start with this uh, TCF Leo. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you good. Okay, good. So this is our TCF Leo. That's our low profile focuser. It's basically uh, the thickness of an eyepiece, inch and a quarter. I'm going to pull the Sagita out. So you can see, there you go. It runs on our focus link hub. It's a full three inch focuser. What's really cool is we have interchangeable draw tubes. Um, so we've got a split clamp, which you can see here. And to put this split clamp on, this is used for like uh, the big three inch wing correctors or the uh, paracores. Um, to, to install this, you just flip it over, remove these three uh, socket caps, and then this, front draw tube drops out. You put this one in its place and we have taller ones. We have this one. We have one for DSI. We're going to do an M72. So there's a few different options you've got in order to maintain that thin, um, that very thin focuser. So the other thing we've got here on this is our Sagita. This is our off-axis guider. We got a small T-thread in there now, but it's, uh, it's a full uh, three inch uh, uh, off-axis guider. Here's one here, Dan. Okay, I got a cap in the back. But this one, uh, what's really neat about it is you can buy it in the manual version, so you can do the manual focus, or you can buy it with the motor, and you can remotely focus your off-axis guider. And you do that independently of the primary focus, your imager. A lot of reasons for doing that you know, if you're guiding on a very bright star, you want to spread that flux out over multiple uh, pixels. If, uh, you know, if you're using a, uh, I'm trying to think what the, the term is. If, if you're 
um, in, in a remote situation, you just may need to move that fo uh, guide focus independently. All right, you can jump in here anytime too, Dan. Uh, this is our, this is a feather touch, uh, I think it's a two and a half inch or th uh, three inch focuser. And we have our quick sync motor. So this is our standard quick sync and it connects right through to the focus links hub. I've got this one connected to focuser two. Yeah, there you go. Oh, it disengaged. So you can see I'm currently running it through the little hand controller. What sets the quick sync apart is this engageable clutch. So now I'm disengaged and I can focus manually. So for visual guys who also do imaging, it's kind of nice to be able to just disengage and manually focus. There's fine course focus. Now you're motorized again. It's that simple. You know, the good thing about this is you don't lose the fine focus either. Exactly. And how easy is that to install? Um, let me show you. I'm going to disconnect it from the hub. Slide this guy out on. I'm going to use a simple tool to disconnect the fine focus, loosen the clamp. Boom. That's it. This is our new third links version, right? We call it an FTX 30. The X does, uh, indicates that all the electronics are inside and slide that on, do the very same thing. Thank you. There it is. Head down the clamp. I always test it sure it's clear. Now we're engaged. Now if I had this set up, alpaca would work. You could run this right from your Raspberry Pi or your Nook, whatever you're using on the uh, uh, control system. So we have the quick sync for all the feather touch. Shut that video there. There we go. So we have quick sync for all the feather touch focusers. We also have quick sync for the uh, Takahashi. And then for a lot of the import focusers, we use, uh, we go to the other side of the focuser. So we replace the coarse knob rather than the fine knob. And we have the same type of clutch mechanism. So I disengage. This is an Explore Scientific three inch hex, right? So we got fine, coarse, Back in, and this is actually the one that uh, Daniel was demonstrating on. That's the one attached directly to a Raspberry Pi. Yeah. I, I gotta say something about that particular motor is, the thing here is though, you're, the design of what you do for the focuses, it's not just a generic one size fits all bolt in and hope for the best type scenario. You went out of your way to develop this motor specifically for this focuser, which very few companies, if any companies, even attempt to do. Exactly. And so we've got Explore Scientific, Skywatcher, of course, the Feather Touch. Um, we have a number, all, all the Stellar View focusers. We can, uh, you know, we can, can motorize any of uh, Vix focusers. And Takahashi. Takahashi as well. Yeah. What? We need, we need ACFs. Yeah, and then of course our uh, TCF or our Focus Links hub will also run all of our TCF focusers. But our newest product is the TCF LSI. So now we can put all the control electronics in the side, and it is all driven by the same Focus Links and Alpaca uh, drivers. We have the another version of the TCF Leo. And then uh, I want to talk a little bit about the rotators. Now, our big focuser is the Gemini. We have, uh, this is a Gemini 96, we, uh, 96 millimeter clear aperture. We also have a 120. And they run with the same type of hub 
but it's a Gemini specific hub because we do rotation rather than uh, focus on both uh, channels. So that's what the Gemini is. This is nice because it's uh, about two and, uh, two and a quarter inches thick or so. So uh, we've got a lot of those out in the field. Um, then stepping down from there, we have our Pixis two inch. This is our third generation and it has a USB serial connection and then also an ethernet connection. But what's really interesting on this is we opened up the clear aperture for two full two inches. So if you have a, uh, um, let's say you've got a, a big Newtonian and you need to get a paracore, right? Let me do this without too much trouble. So we've got a special little brass ring. You just adjust that for the height, that slips in and then locks down. Just lock it down onto the set screws. So now you can set the height of the paracore so that it's always right for your imaging package. And then this whole system will, with the right adapter, fit right there with the Leo. So now you've got another type of focusing rotator. There we go. Can't do it reaching over the table. Oh, I brought the wrong adapter. Yeah, my fault. <laughs> Normally it has a two inch, two inch uh, um, nose piece. Put it on the right side. Bonehead. <laughs> there we go. All right. So that goes in. And then again, you can do your paracord. Now you've got focus, rotation, all in a thin package that would fit on a Newtonian, one of these fast Newtonians, and uh, you could fully remotely control. And the smallest of all of our rotators. It's a T-thread rotator. This is our Pixis LE. This thing is only 0.7 inches thick. Um, the draw tube or the nose piece, it's buried completely inside the focuser. So you put it in a two inch focuser. And again, you have a fairly narrow or thin package. So this would work great on Schmidt Casses or even a number of the long throw um, uh, apples out there. Oh, you, you know, I'm going to tell you now, I know this thing works really good with almost any refractor and DSLR mirrorless camera. I only know this because I've tried it to death. <laughs> and you can see in my Instagram feed that I have one of these rotators and I make it spin around for, you know, sometimes I just do it fun. <laughs> yep. And uh, the only other thing we've got we were going to show today was the uh, uh, high speed filter wheel. I'll go grab that on the other table. Uh, Simon is a huge fan, so we want to make sure that we show it today for everybody to take a look at. Hold on just a minute. So this is our high speed filter wheel. Um, very much like the original intelligent filter wheel, but all the electronics are inside. So it's USB and power, very similar to the way we do our third links. Um, this will be LPACA ready as well by the end of the year. Uh, we're going to make that commitment to uh, bring everything to LPACA standard uh, as soon as possible. Hopefully, you'll be seeing uh, us rolling out new drivers, you know, every month for the next few months. So basically, you guys got your work cut out for you. Oh, yeah. Dan's going to be busy. <laughs> yeah, he loves this stuff, though. He, we were in, you know, we were doing the uh, kind of preliminary session last night, and Simon and I were talking, <laughs> and Daniel's over here coding. Oh, yeah, he's just banging away and going at it. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't even want to know. It's like every spare minute, it doesn't matter what he's doing. He could be eating, going to the bathroom, washing the car. He's got one hand and one eye coding away <laughs> he's always thinking too he's always thinking about what to do next so he's uh he's a great member of our team i'll tell you he makes this stuff sing all righty okay let's go back into gallery view so um i think that pretty much concludes everything um for this particular event 
Uh, hopefully you guys got to see a really good insight into uh, ASCOM Alpaca and what it really means and how we're going to actually utilize it and, and the fact that we need you guys to adopt it more than anything else. So uh, I think Bob is still hiding in the background. You want to come back, Bob? I, I know you're there. Let's see if we can drag him back in and we'll do our final goodbyes. Either that or he's getting a cup of coffee. I'm guessing he is. Oh, there he is. There he is. Are you back with us, Bob? Oh, no, your microphone's muted. We can't hear you. I had to unmute my mic on my There you picture. go. I, I thought okay. you'd been a mime artist then. Yeah. So, um, there... I'm sorry, I missed a question. I was actually out of the office, so well, we <laughs> I heard you that. guys talking about me. <laughs> no, we, yeah, we, we were ran in real quick. <laughs> we, we were signing off, so you know, we uh, just last goodbyes basically. Um, okay. So again, Bob, thank you very much for doing this again because uh, I know you You're were welcome. on the last event, but to me, this was important, and I think it was important for everybody else to see Alpaca actually working because, like I said. The nerd in me yesterday was just freaking out, jumping around, and I did get to see a part of the API that we can't talk about just yet last night that really got things cooking. But to see the API up and running and Daniel doing his thing, and then all I can say is, is we were looking at raw numbers of something, but we, but I knew what it was right off the bat before we even got too far in it, I'm like going, this actually is around the corner. So who knows? So yeah, Bob, thank you very much. Jeff, thank You're you most for welcome. doing this. Daniel, I really do appreciate you spending some time out of your programming days and your um, optech time to do this for us uh, and, and to show everybody at home. And I would like to say one thing also. Go for it. For those of you who are still with us, um, Really, I know that what you saw on the demo segment was could probably be a little bit overwhelming and hard for you to figure out which pieces were connected to what and what was going on. If you want to go back and look at it again, it will probably be a lot clearer. Um, there's a lot there because there's a lot ready. And again, I want to thank Jeff and Jeff for having the vision to see that this is really where things need to go. And he's a pioneer in astronomy for being able to see that. And then, like I said, putting his money where his mouth was and putting and funding Daniel's work on the ASCOM platform as well as their own products. Part of that work of Daniel's went to the community and Jeff and Tina paid for it. And I want to thank them for having the vision and the confidence in the, in the concept to do that. Thank you guys. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Jeff, for doing this. Um, I do appreciate it. I think the world of astronomy will appreciate it when this rolls out, and then you guys are going to be at the forefront. And, of course, Daniel, who I'm now going to call the alpaca king, <laughs> is is the guy behind it all. Yeah. So the goal is any device on any computer controlled by any tablet or anything, any device doesn't Any matter device. yep yeah no more windows no more i got a mac no i don't want to hear it no longer it doesn't matter whatever you got it's gonna work exactly all right speaking like to, of, oh, oh, go one ahead quick one was quick shout out again to peter simpson you know a lot of that 6.5 platform stuff i was just demoing that's all his stuff he made it that smooth he made it that good thanks peter thank you we're gonna have to get peter on at some point we really do yes all right, so on, uh, on that note, uh, again, thank you very much for watching. If you like any of the products that you saw today, um, including the QHY cameras and any of the Optech stuff, of course, Woodland Hills Camera and Telescope is more than happy to uh, help you and facilitate any of your needs. If you've got any more questions, feel free to contact myself. You can find me from the store. It's very, very easy. If you need to contact Jeff directly or Daniel, uh, again, all of that information can be found on their website. So it's optech.usa for optech and then ASCOM standards for the ASCOM uh, website. 
Yep, it's so, actually Optech Inc. Oh, Optech Inc. Or Optech Inc. Dot com. Yeah, because uh, Optech dot US gets you to displays or something, big LED displays. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oopsies. That's all right. Optech Inc. I N C, not I N K. Um, dot com, and there's no H on the uh, Optech. It's just O P T E C. All right. Thank you very much for watching. Um, we're not going to have to do a, a usual play out video because I need to end this stream pretty sharpish because I've got other commitments that I have to get to. But I do appreciate everybody being in on this stream. And next video that we're doing um, is going to have a whole bunch of interesting, weird and wonderful things. So check on our website in uh, a couple of days, probably tomorrow or Friday, we will be publishing more information on that. Um, so I think that one's going to be the 22nd of July. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for watching. We'll see you again shortly. Thank you.